Jim Crockett Promotions presents Ric Flair's Last Match, July 31st at the Nashville Municipal Auditorium. StarCast Weekend in Nashville, bringing wrestling companies together for one of the most unique cards ever assembled. Main evented by Ric Flair's Last Match. Tickets are on sale right now at RicFlair'sLastMatch.com. And you can catch the show live streaming on pay-per-view and Fight TV for only $34.99. Ric Flair's Last Match. Walk in that aisle one more time for the last time. StarCast is presented in part by ProWrestlingTees.com. T-shirts designed and sold by over 2,500 pro wrestlers. By Lenny Bakken, certified financial planner. And by Powerbomb Pizza. Pizza crafted and sold by pro wrestlers. Powerbomb Pizza, powered by Kitsch Data. Hey everybody, Eric Bischoff here, and have you heard about Strictly Business? Strictly Business is a brand new weekly series exclusively on adfreeshows.com. Join me and my co-host John Alba every Tuesday as we take a deep dive into the business of the professional wrestling business. And this is some straight up business talk here, no fanboy nonsense. We discuss television contracts, advertising, licensing, and of course the highly debated ratings. So if you want an unfiltered, brutally honest, anti-fanboy understanding of the professional wrestling industry, well, Strictly Business is the series for you. And hey, if Elon Musk likes my tweets, and he did, you're going to love Strictly Business. Sign up now and listen at adfreeshows.com. It's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to another edition of Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the hardcore legend himself, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? Doing great, Conrad. Uh, at the end of the last show, I gave what I thought was pretty heartfelt thank you to all of our listeners. Absolutely. And I meant every word of it. And so in case I forget to do that at the end, let me say up top, thank you for listening. You've got a lot of choices to make, great choices. And uh, I thank you for including us in that choice. I'm excited, man. I, uh, I don't know what I expected when we first talked about doing this podcast. It's been a long time coming, but uh, I guess this is our sixth episode now. I, I feel like we're, uh, we're hitting our stride, man. Oh, man. I feel like I hit a home run, like we have hit a home run. I yeah. don't feel once like I, we talked last episode about the importance of taking your swings, even if you strike out. But I feel like we're going yard every time we do the show. I love it. Well, today is going to be something that uh, a lot of old school fans are going to cherish. We're talking about Spring Stampede 1994, Mick. And that era of WCW is an interesting time, not just in WCW or your life, but the wrestling business, is it not? I don't know if I was ever in a, uh, a company where it was not an inter interesting time for the business. So. It just feels like in 94, the business feels decidedly smaller than it was a handful of years before. But you've still got some hardworking guys and gals here trying to make an impression and give it their all. But WCW in April of 94... You know, we're just a couple of months away from Hulk Hogan coming in, and they do the Bash at the Beach that year and sets all kinds of records. But at this point, WCW is still decidedly in the number two sure. spot. Yeah. Um, but man, there was some great talent. Uh, let's let's take us back here. We're coming off Super Brawl Four from Albany, Georgia, in February. But there's just so much change going on in WCW. At this point, it feels like Eric Bischoff and Ric Flair are fully in charge of WCW, and now there's an influx of new talent coming in. Uh, Sherry Martell has basically replaced Missy Hyatt as like the lead woman mm -hmm. uh, for WCW. Um, before we go down the road of talking about the individual talents, Eric Bischoff and his rise in WCW, did that shock you? Oh, sure, yeah, it sure did. I remember uh, DDP calling me up and saying, ding dong, the witch is dead, in reference to Bill Watts being replaced. And he said, uh, you'll never guess who's taking his place. I said, who? He said, Bish. And I had to ask him, like, who? He said, Bish, because Bish was like, Eric Bischoff was probably number three. He uh, calls himself a third string announcer. He, okay, uh, he was the third leading announcer. He, we didn't, we're not aware of his sales background. Uh, we were not aware that the uh, 
ninja game that was featured on AWA was uh, Bish's deal. And, uh, you know, it's a corporate structure. Uh, Bill Watts was still uh, a renegade, yeah. intent on doing things his own way. And, um, you know, he had come in with some great ideas, but brought, brought morale down in a hurry, unnecessarily. Like, you don't need to break us, right? Like, we, we've been on this road. We've been here a long time. We've been doing this. Like, uh, you're gonna, you want to really want to take away the catering before a seven hour taping. You want to take away the coffee before a seven hour taping. These things, uh, you should know as a businessman, you know, sometimes it takes money sure. to make money. And I think feeding the guys and getting them a little bit caffeinated when they need it is uh, a cost you need to be able to make. So. Bill Watts, I'm sure we'll talk about him a lot in the future, but uh, what a change to go from Bill Watts to Eric Bischoff. I mean, yeah. it feels like, and again, I've never met Mr. Watts, but we hear he uh, led by fear and intimidation a lot, and he was from the old school, and now here's maybe a different kind of cat in Eric Bischoff. Did you think it would work? Well, I was, I was proud to be a Bill Watts guy. I was glad that he liked me as a wrestler. Um, I think the harshest condemnation ever had for me is he started to say something and he went, oh, damn, I know you're doing your best. So that was as harsh as it got from Bill. And wow. Bill was in charge when I was having a tremendous problem with uh, uh, whooping cough, hiatal hernia, uh, I couldn't really put my finger on it for a long time, so I was having trouble just breathing. Wow. Yeah, I guess you could argue I should have taken some time off, right? Uh, I remember Barry Windham saying that he shouldn't be in the ring, you know? I mean, I had like 30 seconds before I just started <gasps> heaving because I had whooping cough. Didn't know it at the time and shouldn't be out there in the ring, you know, with something as, uh, as limited as it is and, you know, contagion-wise. It does, it does, you can catch it. Uh, so I was there with Bill through some tough times. I didn't care for the, the you know, the, the whole edict about staying until the very end. Yeah. Even when you, you know, I think I quoted Nikita Koloff uh, back about four weeks ago where there was a group meeting and uh, uh, Nikita raised his hand and said, Bill, I know how important it is for uh, everyone to uh, uh, stay till the end, but there's sometimes we've been on the road for a couple of weeks. We might have a chance to uh, catch a last flight out on a Sunday. Uh, would you consider changing the rules for that? And Bill said, "That's uh, tough business on families." Okay, any more questions? Let's go. And it was like it just, it just, he didn't even entertain the thought. Yeah. And he also uh, um, called a meeting, and uh, uh, you know, we just, uh, <laughs> you and I witnessed Mr. McMahon's interview with Pat McAfee, yeah. where he talked about having no empathy for people who are late but bill didn't even have empathy for people who were one minute early you know bill he locked the door a minute before the meeting was supposed to take place and said everyone else was late so he was a difficult guy to get along with for everyone uh, i got along with him there were others who did uh and so when i heard ding dong the witch is dead on one hand i was like wow Whoa, Bish is in, that's great. I've got a guy that I know that I can talk to. Um, but on the other hand, I was like, man, I was doing pretty good under Bill Watts. Right. I was doing pretty good. Change is not always a good thing. And I wasn't sure. I was a little uncertain as to what the future would hold. What was your relationship like with, with, with Bish? Uh, I mean, did you travel together? Did you just spend times together at the show? Or did you have a personal relationship? Yeah, like? I, I did have a relationship with Eric. Um, uh, he was friends, like, longtime friends with DDP. Uh, DDP was one of my, you know, my closest friends. And Eric Bischoff was a guy I talked to frequently, a guy I considered, a, you know, a good friend. And so it w was going to be really unusual that you could just call up the boss and uh, and ask questions you know and and in short order that was no longer the case you know eric really uh rose to the occasion you yeah. know became a, a corporate guy changed the face of the business uh you know, made his mistakes along the way which i i know he's uh, you know uh, taking responsibility for but also uh, uh was a forward outside the box thinker who did change the face of wrestling so now let's talk about some of these roster changes. You know, Missy Hyatt has been a big part of wrestling for a long time at this point. Um, I mean, I'd seen her in the territory days, but certainly she'd been a really big part of WCW yeah. broadcasts. Any Missy memories? 
I love Missy um, because I met Missy when I was nobody. And that's, it's really nice. When you meet someone, when you're nobody, they're somebody and they go out of their way to be nice to you. They're over with, they're over in my book Yeah. Uh, for the duration. And so I happened to have met Missy in 100 West Virginia, really difficult uh, town to get to. I was driving with Shane Douglas pre-GPS. These are in the mountains. This is a little small town in the mountains of West Virginia. We thought, how will anyone even be able to find their way here? And we get into the gymnasium and it's just rocking. There was about 800 people, which is big, you know, sold out, right? I'm hanging from the rafters. Uh, I go to use the facilities and why in 100 West Virginia they have no stalls, I don't know. It's just a row of toilets. And uh, I was perched on one of those toilets when uh, I made Missy's acquaintance. Yeah, she, <laughs> she walked in and uh, caught the future hardcore legend dropping a deuce. And uh, that was the beginning of a great friendship. And uh, Protocol uh, there is you don't finish until she leaves the room. I, we'd never been schooled in that at the Danucci School. I'm just school. asking. He never said, uh, my boy. <laughs> no, we did not know the answer to that. I think she ran out of the room. Sure. She ran out of the room. It's but uh, Missy response. was great. It was always great to me. Uh, you know, I got, man, I, I just avoided a tense confrontation with New Jack one time when... Um, when uh, during the Terry Funk roast in Philadelphia. I'm not sure if you ever heard that. No. Man, um, there was a pre pre uh, pre roast. Missy breaks down. Was this ninety seven? Um, no, this is uh, early two thousands probably. Okay. okay. Early two thousands. Um, Missy breaks down before we go out. I go over. I say, "What's wrong?" And she tells me that there's a guy back there who has tormented her. Uh, not internet trolling type of thing, but has called her names, has uh, um, humiliated her in public, uh, and he's a big guy. He's, he's jacked, you know. And I and I walk up. I said, "Man, you have to leave." He's, "What do you mean?" I said, "You don't treat Missy Hyatt that way." I remember Kevin Sullivan was right there too, you know. And here I am, I'm beaten up, I'm past my prime, here's a guy that's jacked, and I'm going, you got, you, you have to leave. You know, to be back here is a privilege. Yes. And you have, you, uh, your privileges are, are over. And so, uh, now we go up on the, and then I was, I was shaking a little bit. And the guy approached me later, he had tears in his eyes, he was so sorry, he was trying to say it was just in character, I said, you don't, you don't treat someone like Missy, that you don't treat anybody that way. Now we go up on the dais or whatever it's called, and every comic has their stuff on Missy. Oh, They're, it's like the same jokes over and over. Yeah, and they stop becoming funny. And it's just mean. And, uh, yeah, it just becomes mean. And uh, one of the comics, uh, you know, he he was a guy that I got to know later when I got got into comedy. He said, I think I was already in it. So this may have been two thousand nine. You know, I just had my just getting my feet wet. And um, he said something along the line, I'm a, I'm a Jew without a job, that's like being a black guy with a small, you know, yeah. black bone. And then he says something about New Jack, and Jack comes up on the stage, and Jack starts going to business for himself on Missy. And I just said, that's enough. And like, I, I just, I didn't snap, because I mean, I didn't snap in the sense that I think I can, uh, you know, you know, deal up New Jack a beating. And he looks at me and says, what? I said, Jack, that's enough. Everyone on this stage, it's, it's piling on. I've heard enough. He's saying, are you telling me you want me to stop? And I said, yes, I am. And he looks at me and says, I'm gonna do that out of respect for you. And thus a great aversion was avoided, but it was, it was tense. And uh, I know the next day I was driving to uh, Six Flags with my kids and Missy texted me and said, nobody's ever stood up for me like, like that. You know, you are over with me forever. So yeah, yeah, I go back a long way. I go back to 86 with Missy. Uh, always enjoyed working with her in uh, WCW. You know, did a little angle, you know, when I teamed up with Max Payne. Uh, which, in retrospect, was not cool, you know. The, 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 the ugly guy kisses the beautiful woman, yeah. always gets a pop. Uh, not only is it, is it not 
acceptable these days, but I actually missed and kissed her on the neck. <laughs> like, I couldn't even do that right. Dipped her and couldn't even, yeah, I couldn't even make contact. But yeah, I, I, will, I always like Missy. I think Missy is, is criminally underrated, her importance in wrestling. I feel like people go to like, uh, who was the first big blonde bombshell yeah. that, and everybody says Sonny. Uh, and don't get me wrong, her influence is undeniable. But Missy Hyatt was doing that 10 years prior. And she did it everywhere she went. Yeah. She did it in the Mid-South. She did it um, uh, in the work, world, world class, class. Continental. Yeah, yeah. She, was, she, was, she was great. And she still is great. I saw her about six months ago. Why do you, th- and I, by the way, I, uh, I've gotten to know Missy a little bit. Um, we actually helped her with her mortgage. Uh, but nice. A, a genuinely sweet person, mm-hmm. like a really great person. But it feels like, for whatever reason, it was in fashion to... Be mean to Missy. Why do you think that became a thing? I can't really put my finger on where the... Because everybody has a story of, here's where the heat comes from, brother. Nobody has a Missy story like what the transgression was. But it was in fashion to sort of dunk on her for a while, and it just seems mean. Yeah, I I don't know. Maybe because it was she had the uh, the Hollywood uh, outsider boyfriend, Jason Hervey. Maybe it's because, uh, you know... I, don't, I can't imagine her uh, being married to Eddie Gilbert put heat on her. No. Uh, I don't know. I know it was in fashion to dunk on her, and I never I never liked that because I always thought the world of her. Yeah, and we treat people how they treat us, and, and she was phenomenal. And now Sherry Martell is coming in. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be talking about her quite a bit, but, boy, another great talent gone way too soon, man. Yeah. I'm laughing not because she's gone too soon, but because she was here. Here's, you know, you talk about treating people the way that they treat you. So I go, uh, I'm an independent guy. This is uh, 80, probably 87, so I'm starting to make a little name for myself. Maybe it's even early 88. You know, I get keeping time frame as I get my first job in Memphis in summer of 88. Dave writes that I'm the best no-name independent out there, could be, who some considered. And then within two, three days, my phone rings five times and I get three different offers. And I, from the Observer, you From think. the Observer. So that's the, the New York Times of uh, wrestling uh, newsletters. Uh, and their, you know, their influence is undeniable. So I get an offer from... Uh, uh, the Savoldi's up in Maine, which is really not an offer. I get an offer from uh, Tommy Gilbert, Eddie's dad in Kansas City. I get an offer from um, from uh, Memphis, and I end up going the Memphis route. Why did you uh, pick Memphis? Uh, because they had the track record. Yeah. You know, they had the track record. Tommy's thing, Tommy Gilbert's thing in Kansas City was new, trying to resurrect a dead ter- territory. The thing in Maine was uh, part-time work. And uh, they had the track record. Uh, you know, I struggled for sure. I struggled mightily in uh, in Memphis, but it was a great place to learn, and I learned on a daily basis. And I also learned how not to treat people, because that was an example where of a place where I thought people could have been a little nicer without much effort, and went out of their way to make life a little more difficult on me than it needed to be management or other wrestlers i'd say you know it sounds crazy yeah but there was a i felt like there was an anti-northern bias wow and that i wasn't in the loop and so when you are coming in you are taking someone's job and uh, for example i was going to cost tojo Yamamoto bookings. Now, Tojo at that time legend. was a legend, but he was well up in age. You know, he was doing the type of thing where he'd throw a chop and hit him, you know, on the hit the ropes and hit himself. But he was still a revered figure there. And I was costing a couple guys part time work, maybe one guy full time work. And, uh, you know, I would be lectured about the northern style that I had. And then in, in the last week, we talked about the, the cowardly heel. And how it's a good fit for some people, but Leon White at 420 pounds doesn't have any business being the cowardly heel. Right. And while I appreciated it, I just didn't think people wanted to watch a show 
with uh, a, a cliched, you know, the, the same guy, different guys doing the same thing. I'm right. a big fan of what I call the Memphis backpedal, right? Babyface makes the comeback and it gets to the point of, whoa, let's, let's talk about it, you know, as walking backward, you know, walking back, whoa. And when done well, it's incredible. You know, these guys, yes. some of the best in Memphis, you know, they, they work that crowd, you know, and the ba baby face, oh, I come out, you know, that type of thing. And it works, undeniably it works, but it's not for everyone. Right. And if I'm doing it in match one, by the time you get to match seven or eight in your it main event, it's not the same thing. And you ultimately want Lawler, who's going to close every match. You want him, when that guy does the Memphis backpedal, you know, and you want Jerry bringing down the thing and you want it bringing down the house. So I just thought it was, I just, I, I thought it was, uh, Bad. I thought I didn't buy into uh, the wrestling as coward all the time, every time. And uh, and I yeah, I, I, there were guys who did go out. Robert Fuller, right? Jeff Jarrett. Jeff and I are still friends to this day. Robert Fuller and I are still friends to this day. Robert Fuller was like my guru, right? Uh, rode with them and learned both what to do and what not to do because Robert had not done a great job of saving his money as his, his brother uh, Ronald had, uh, but a great mind, one of the great storytellers, great characters we've ever had in this business. And uh, so I made a lot of progress, but there were some definite growing pains there. So. We're learning all of your nicknames. We learned a few weeks ago, Mr. In Your House, <laughs> and now we've got Best No Name Wrestler. Uh, but you were talking about Memphis as a time when you first met Sherry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry. Thanks for putting me on track. I was, as I'm talking, I'm going, thinking, where is this going? Do I need to come around? <laughs> so, before, I'd say three, four months, I'm thinking it's March, March, uh, uh, this would be March 1988. Yeah, in March 88. Okay. Because I get my job in uh, in uh, July of 88 in Memphis. Um, Louis Fabiano, good hand on the Long Island area, good bump taker. Uh, never really, he meant to, went to Continental, worked Puerto Rico, but never really became a name. Uh, I remember Louis going, Dutch has a gimmick for me. He may have worked Memphis as well. I said, what is he? He goes, the New York thug which bears slight resemblance to the Brooklyn Brawler, a right? Bit. A, little, a little, little bit. bit. A little bit. So I wasn't as excited as Louie was about a second-rate <laughs> version of a, of a fairly mundane yes. character. I don't want to badmouth the Brooklyn Brawler because it was a good... He good, had his place. He had his place. He had his place. And uh, it was a fun character. But I don't... It wasn't like guys were looking for ways to... I want to do that. I want to do that. I want to do that. But on a... On a you know, with less eyeballs on it. Uh, but anyway, Louis and I attend a WWF show back when they used to run high schools. And Louis telling me he went on a tour with, and he knows Sherry and he's at the, you know, talking to somebody uh, in the in the front of the WWF dressing room office. Uh, can you tell her Louis Fabiano's here? And you figure, Sherry's a big star. She's going to come, you know, she hears an indie guy. She went on a tour somewhere, you know, pass a note to him, come out for two seconds. And instead, she comes out with all that southern warmth and just Louis and hugged on him. And it was like... This is one of the nicest people you could meet. Yes. And Sherry, as you mentioned, she's gone way too soon. Uh, she had a tough life yep. uh, coming up. Uh, and she left us way too soon. Um, but man, did she leave a mark, right? The stuff she did, uh, not only with Sean, but later on with Rick, the stuff she did with Shane Douglas. She was a, she was a major, major player. And... Uh, and when she came into uh, WCW, she she made a difference there too. I hate that she's gone before the nostalgia of pro wrestling became yeah. in fashion again. Yeah. Like she would have been celebrated so yeah. huge, right? But she wasn't here to enjoy it and appreciate it. She made it into the hall, though. Yes, she did. She made it into the hall, which was really cool. And she and she, I remember how much it meant when she would compliment uh, the women the of of the next era, our era. You know, when she would talk to one of the women, I remember when that year she was inducted into the hall and talking, 
uh, Melina was like on cloud nine when uh, Sherry complimented her. So she was she was great for someone who was you know a scary Sherry and uh, and uh, was willing to make herself look ridiculous. Uh, she was a really classy. She was a really classy woman in an unconventional way. Welcome back. This segment of Foley is Pod is presented by Zen Nicotine Pouches, the simpler way to experience nicotine satisfaction and enjoy lasting change on your terms. Zen Nicotine Pouches are fresher, simpler way to enjoy nicotine that's helped millions of people achieve lasting change by offering smoke-free and spit-free satisfaction. I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life where I needed to make a change, like when I turned 40. I knew I needed to make a change, but I just wasn't ready yet. I'm sure a lot of smokers and dippers out there can relate. And Zen understands there isn't just one right time to make a change. Everyone's timeline is a little different. Everyone's on their own journey. So whenever you feel like you're ready to take that first step toward change, Zen will be there for you with the right strength, the right flavor at the right time. If you're thinking about making a change and want to learn more today, check out Zen Nicotine Patches at Zen.com. That's Z-Y-N.com. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. It's also reported in The Observer that Kevin Sullivan and Evad Sullivan, that's Dave backwards, uh, will be managed by Sherry in their upcoming feud against the Nasty Boys for the WCW Tag Team titles. And when things are so planned in advance and shows are taped in Orlando oftentimes, you know, three months in advance. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty obvious pretty quickly what the company has in mind for you, even if it, they don't necessarily sit you down and say, here's what we're doing. When you get those Orlando tapings, you know, okay, so this is kind of the idea, right? Mm-hmm. So what do you remember about those marathon Orlando tapings in that era? Because there's good and bad reports I've heard from those. On one hand, it was it was great that we were at uh, Disney MGM, they used to call it. Now it's Disney's Hollywood Studios. Uh, but my kids were so little at the time that we would actually go to Cocoa Beach and get a place on the beach, and then I would commute back and forth. There were some good times. Uh, um, at, I believe it was the Marriott Residence Inn where the, the men and women would stay. There were some good times. They would have a, a party outside. I remember Dewey being about uh, just old enough to, to, to uh, walk, and he was in a little gown, and he was swaying to the music. And my wife to this day remembers Leon White just gazing at him, you know, like like this, here's this rugged guy, the stiffest guy, you know, stiffest, hardest hitting guy in this business, and he's just so enamored with, you know, this little, you know, and I'm talking enamored in a positive way, you know, yeah. you look at the beauty of a child. My wife will never forget that. that I also, a cute moment. I also remember uh, a rooming with the Armstrongs. Really? Brad and Brian, this was a time when uh, my, uh, my wife wasn't on this trip, and uh, we were a little bit off the, we were a, a half a mile or a mile away or so from the, the, the residents in there. And the Armstrong, they come home and man, they've been through a tussle. These guys are talking ble bleeding lips, bloody noses. And so I hear them yelling when they, you know, as they're coming in and I'm, I have this vision when they open up the door that these guys have fended off five, six people, you know, back to back, brother to brother. Turns out the fight was between Brad and Brian in front of everybody. Like, I didn't see the fight. But, like my brother and I, there was a definite no punching in the face rule, well, yeah. right? Like I guess Bullet didn't instill the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> these guys clearly taking face shots, you know? So when I asked Brian about it at one of my shows, he went, white trash, white trash, you know? That's the way they were. I don't know if any brothers loved each other more or fought each other more, but uh, they were they were a unique family for sure. Brian Armstrong, of course, is going to go on to be Road Dog. Yeah, uh, we know that he had such an incredible career. You know, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera. Yeah. But Brad Armstrong, another guy gone wow. way too soon. Way but too everybody soon. who wrestled in Mick says he was one of the best that ever did it. Just a consummate professional. I remember uh, Vader coming back, and this is you know. Uh, middle of the card, he's, he's Vader in, in a rare match where he doesn't have a, a main event, and he comes back and he says, 
what an honor it was to work with that guy. And I think everybody felt that way. So I only had a handful of matches with Brad when he wasn't Arachnaman. Yeah. Which Marvel exercised its uh, Pretty quickly. veto on. But no, that's the same guy, just in purple and yellow. But that was, it was one of those WCW matches at the Georgia Mountain Center. I think it's going to be uh, Hammer and, and, uh, and Arachnaman against me and an opponent I can't remember. And uh, uh, the Georgia Mountain Center was marked by a stairwell at the left side of the building uh, that was a straight shot. It was like three or four flights of stairs all leading down. So there were no twists and turns. It just went all the way down. And Dusty's talking to me and he goes, and he gets this far away look in his eye. He goes, oh, damn, I remember <laughs> Tampa Armory. I give Harley Race a shot, and I'll be damned if Harley Race doesn't take that whole bump, goes down ass over tea kettle, down every one of those stairs. You've never seen anything like it. And then he looks at me and goes, now I'm not saying I want you to try that. And then I go, I think I can do that. Yeah. And it wasn't until I was halfway home to Atlanta that I thought, he wanted me to do that, you know. Yes, like he, did. he made me feel like that idea was my idea, yep. and I was glad we did it. But going back to to Brad, I think the most incredible thing I saw from Brad was actually not in ring, but backstage in a game of Hangman. Okay. Where with <laughs> I, I think I'm playing with uh, Dennis Knight and Mark Canterbury. You guys and just randomly play Hangman. Randomly playing stuff. Hangman because there's a blackboard up there, right? So it's like Hangman is like Wheel of Fortune, except you have the for kids. Yeah, for kids, and it's a long, it's a long puzzle. It's going to be difficult to solve, and there's only like four <laughs> letters that are actually up there. Maybe there's six letters, but I'm saying there's a whole lot of blank spaces. And Brad walks into the room, goes. I love the nightlife, I've got the boogie, and he walked out of the room, we all went, how did you do that? That's exactly what it was, because it was my puzzle. The old 70s song, I love the nightlife, I, we've got, I've got the boogie. So he was, a, he, was, he was one of those guys, and he is probably the greatest example of the guy who would have been so well served by being the real Brad Armstrong. Yes. And he would make you laugh in the dressing room as hard as anybody, and then he would go out and be boots and trunks. And he was a great worker, but he was always that guy, you know. Between him and Midian, Dennis Knight was another backstage uh, entertainer, and uh, I couldn't find a way to channel that. In those cases, couldn't find a way to channel that personality into the the in ring character. At least I didn't try naked Brad Armstrong. Just saying. Right, right. So can I, you know, this is one, uh, uh, my, I was the commissioner when Naked Midian was in town, right? Yeah. And so it's still plausible in 2000 that the uh, commissioner of a soon-to-be billion-dollar company doesn't have a cell phone, right? It's yeah. plausible, right? So I, I need, to, Midian's my assistant. He's, uh, he's got nothing but the pouch, right? He's naked except for the pouch. And I said, uh, oh, man, I need to make a, I need to make a, a phone call. Do you have a quarter? He goes, yeah, right here in my pouch. And I reached back and I said, I, I just need one, not a whole roll. And he said, that's not my pouch. <laughs> just, it never made the air, you know. That's is, tremendous. Is that not a great line? In that our is business? a tremendous line. That's not my pouch, right? And it never made it. the air. At least I don't think it made the air. Yeah. It's trains, planes, and automobiles. Those aren't pillows. <laughs> then they start thing. talking about the Bears game. Tremendous. Um, the other big rumor at the time here in WCW is that Hulk Hogan's coming into the company. Uh, in hindsight. You know, we all know that that worked out. I mean, the NWO is mm -hmm. going to become huge and reignite fire for the business. But at the time, were you excited at the idea of Hogan coming we're in? We're talking June. Yeah, yeah. We, I guess it would have been announced before that. But yeah, yeah. there were rumors even, I think, back in like February. You know, Conrad, it was hard for me to get excited uh, because I had lost my ear and that injury was not capitalized on. And it was it was it was a down time for me because I was so excited, even elated. When you get an injury, you get that flight or fight reflex, so you get a rush of adrenaline a lot of the time. 
So when I walked back into the dressing room and my first words were, I think I just lost my effing ear. Bang, bang. Didn't know it at the time until Booker T yeah. uh, you know, gave his uh, in, induction, you know, his speech. When he's inducted in the Hall of Fame, that was his first road trip with his brother Stevie Ray. Here I come, missing my ear, saying, I think I lost my effing ear. Bang, bang. He turns to his brother and says, man, I'm, I'm not sure this business is for me. You know, I think looking back on it, a lot of credit. I should get a lot of credit for having the wherewithal and commitment to get my catchphrase in in front Absolutely. of the boys bang, in bang. the dressing room. But now the big letdown is they're doing nothing. We're doing nothing with this angle. And it just seemed like this is a gift from the wrestling gods. And if they're not going to capitalize on that, that's some pretty bold writing on the wall. So it was hard for me to get excited about the company because I knew that I didn't have much of a future in that company. Let me ask in terms of the two C's, and we've talked about this before, but JR always says in wrestling it comes down to cash and creative. And going back a decade prior to this, uh, when the WWF was running two or sometimes three shows a night, you wanted to be on the Hogan card because sure. it meant your payoffs were mm -hmm. bigger. It sounds like the way you've described it, you were more creative first, cash second. I needed to make a living. Um, but it wasn't as important as being creatively fulfilled. Well, there's also the sense that uh, you wanted to sting money. Sure. You wanted to at least be in the middle of, if you know, I came in, uh, Magnum uh, wanted to sell me on the 1500 a week, which is what I left the company at 15 months earlier. And then I said to him, not trying, you know, not trying to be prophetic given, you know, the injury he'd suffered. I said, Magnum, you've seen me wrestle there. There might not be a next year because he had said the next year you could get 150. So um, he said, uh, I'll talk to Jim. And Jim Hurd came over. And I think this is a, one of the only conversations I ever had. He said, I talked to Terry. He thinks you're worth uh, 150 and so do I. And we shook hands on it. But now I've proven that I can deliver. Yep. Um, the second year is not as good as the first year. Uh, the Bill comes, Watts comes in, and and he made it clear that a guy was lucky just to keep that, to keep what he was making. And Bill made a lot of cuts, and a lot of people were looking for work after that. So on one hand, I was lucky, but post Bill Watts, still the same money. Other guys are coming in for more money. Man, I know we all love Gene Okerlund, but man, just on principle, Gene's making three times what I am without taking a bump. Yeah, I just felt like what I ha had done and was continuing to do was not being properly compensated. And uh, there was that conundrum in that you couldn't make the big money unless you were a big star, but you couldn't be a big star unless you were making the big money. So you had the four fifty, four hundred fifty thousand dollar guys and up, but they all seem to have the Turner contracts, and so now I'm looking at a style that is increasingly wearing me out. Uh, you know, I've been working with a uh, a rear posterior knee ligament that's been severed for a while. Uh, bangs and uh, you know we don't know about concussions at that time, right. but I'm I'm racking up a few of those. And I realized I need to make some money. You know, I need to make some money now. And I, I felt like creative was the door to that money. So I can't say one was more important than the other because, uh, you know, you've seen me do a cameo where I get almost as excited and for the sake of one person as yes. I do in front of perform in front of twenty thousand, or even when I put on the red suit and I'm in front of a family of five. You know, and I get and I get that post performance rush. So I love the creative, but I also felt like if I have a hand in my creative and I can cut the promos I want to cut, and if you put me in a, with an opponent, uh, that's right, we're going to over-deliver for you and that that should be compensated. But once the ear thing was not taken advantage of, you know, once I was on that bus in Germany uh, with the fairly fluid German at that time, and I'm not being asked to do any publicity. And now we have the injury that's the gift of, from the booking gods. And that's not taken care of. I, like I said, writing is big and bold on the wall. And I'm trying to find a way out of there. Trying to find a way out since October of, of 93 when I had the match with Vader. And 
thought that him, you know, dropping me backwards on that ramp surely has to end my career. So I've been frustrated for a long time. I'd been providing and saving money and uh, doing pretty good in that respect. We had a, you know, a nice but small and, and, uh, and you know, a fairly economical home outside of Georgia, uh, but I really felt like the clock was ticking and that Hogan's arrival was not going to be doing me any favors. So, you know, you've talked about when we discussed Attitude Era stuff, if you weren't happy with your payoff, you'd go talk to JR. Yeah. Uh, did you ever try to talk to Eric about your... No, because you're on a guarantee at that point. Yeah. So you can't... You, can't, you, you didn't can't, feel like you could go renegotiate. Right. I mean, I tried making more. I tried. I appealed uh, each year, brought, uh, wrote up... Uh, man, if I had that, that'd be probably not only valuable wrestling... Uh, uh, prop if I found out like the eight to ten page uh, you know typed up uh, resume I brought as to why I thought I deserved more money when, when did you do that? this is uh, this is probably late late 93 wow. uh, mid mid 93 and uh, and I also but I also sent it out to the people above Eric in the company and he was not I was not happy about that but I'd worked so hard on it, like I wanted some answers. I thought that, uh, you know, even before we started really looking at the ratings, uh, we just looked at them as an, you know, we, it was important because I remember going up to get my check, maybe this is when I had the exotic dancer with me, I don't know, who was dressed like an exotic dancer. She was playing the role for sure. Um, but there was a big sign on the door that said, welcome to WCW, home of the 3.5, or whatever it was, when the awesome Kongs debuted with Harley, yeah, and they, you know, they were quickly, you know, uh, cast by the wayside. Uh, but that was a great build, and they did a big number. So they lived in, they did, they did appreciate the ratings. And here I supply a list of ratings and how, given the chance in a program, the ratings for Sunday night's main event were steadily going up. When I did my program with uh, Dustin Runnels, Dustin Rhodes, and it didn't, it didn't seem to matter. Uh, they did give me some time off when uh, my wife had uh, Noel, Mr. You know, she had to spend some time in bed, and um, and uh, they gave me, they did give me some time off to finally get that knee surgery uh, fixed. So I can't say that they weren't taking care of me, just not to the degree you would like. Right, and I just. Um, I did not see it as being a long-term home because of their inability to capitalize. I won't say inability, I'll say unwillingness. Yeah. See, what bothered me is they, in my, I believe they knew it would get over and they did not want it to get over. And that was what was so frustrating. All right, boys and girls, you know what time it is. It's time for me to tell you about Chili Sleep, and I was just telling Mick about it. And, and here's the thing about this, Mick. Science tells us the best way to achieve and maintain consistent deep sleep is by lowering our core body temperature. And you've lived in the South. you got to have a ceiling fan in your bedroom. It's like we're required by law down here. Yes. Uh, well, here's the reason. Temperature-controlled sleep is going to repair your muscles after a hard day's work. It's going to improve your cognitive function so you can always start your day feeling sharp and alert. And that's been my experience. I have a chilly sleep. I've got the Uller system. I've had it for over a year now. It's changed my life. What I've got now is a customizable climate-controlled sleep solution that improves my entire well-being. Now, they make the Uller. You can also check out the Cube sleep system. Either way, we're talking hydro-powered mattress toppers right it's temperature controlled it fits over your existing mattress to provide you your ideal sleep temperature let me explain mick my wife likes to sleep a little warmer right so her side she wants to be at like 75 i like to sleep a little cooler i want to be at like 67 yeah i get a perfect night's sleep at that but before i had chilly sleep mick i'm cranking down the ac i'm flipping the pillow now i'm paying to heat my laundry room i, I don't need my laundry room to be cooler i need my bed to be cooler chilly Chilly sleep has made that happen. This is perfect for you to get that deep sleep, whether you sleep hot or cold. Chilly sleep systems are designed to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and give you the confidence and energy to power through your day. Real quick, listen to this now. Imagine waking up and not feeling tired. Chilly sleep can make that happen. They've made it happen for me. Prior to chilly sleep, Mick, I was sleeping like five, six hours a night. With chilly sleep, I'm seven, eight, nine. I even slept 10 hours once with chilly sleep. It's unbelievable to wake up and not feel tired. 
sounds incredible because I'm the same way. My wife likes it hotter. Mm -hmm. I like it cooler. Mm -hmm. I lose out. Of course. I lose that argument. I'm a guy. It's what we do. Yep. And uh, a guy in a successful marriage has to learn to admit he's wrong, even when he knows in his heart he's not every Co once in a while. Correct. Has to learn to uh, make the uh, thermostat the wife's realm. But now we get our say. Well, yeah, man. And, and here's the thing, too. You don't want to wake up all hot and sweaty. You're not going to get a good night's sleep. You're going to get up and pee. You're going to be fighting with the covers. N none of that anymore. So head on over to chillysleep.com forward slash Foley to learn more and save 30% off the purchase of any new Cube or Uller sleep system. This offer is available exclusively for Mick Foley listeners and only for a limited time. That's chili, C-H-I-L-I, -I, sleep.com slash Foley to take advantage of our exclusive discount. Wake up refreshed every day. If you could change one thing about your home, what would it be? A new kitchen, a new master bath, maybe put in a pool. What if you could do it with no money out of pocket and cheaper monthly payments? Savewithconrad.com can help, and you can even skip your next two house payments. NMLS number 65084, equal housing lender, savewithconrad.com. So let's talk about Super Brawl. You and Max Payne team up to defeat the uh, tag team champion Nasty Boys, but it's by DQ. Uh, 12 minutes and 37 seconds is uh, the time of the match. It was Mel by DQ. Yeah. In a, in a no DQ. I thought it was a no DQ match. Well, I think we're getting to that. Oh, wait. wait. So we're talking Clash Super, of the Champions. This is Super Brawl. So, oh, Super, Super Clash. Oh, got you. Got it. Super Brawl is February. Super Brawl is the one where uh, Max suplexes knobs. And with everything we know about the human anatomy, Nob's spine should have snapped in half, right? Yes. I think Arn said, thank goodness that Nob's had the physiological makeup of a jellyfish or he would have been broken in half. You know, Max was a uh, uh, Daryl <laughs> Peterson, great amateur wrestler, all American for Iowa State. There was a little bit of conflict with uh, Max and, and the nasties. They, they ribbed him a little bit. And so I believe they thought it was intentional or not completely unintentional. But when Max grabs knobs and you're waiting for that rotation, you're waiting for it either to either be an overhead belly to belly or the more standard of the time, you know, Steiner belly to belly to the side. And it's kind of a combination of both. And knobs lands front first, like on his collarbone area. It looks like he should be snapped in half. One of the... Uh, sickest looking bumps and I'm not a guy who likes to watch or will watch any of the botch videos I don't find it fun to watch Sid's leg snap in oh, half no. you know I don't like any of that stuff um, this was could have been horrible and thank god it wasn't and I think Nobbs wrestled the next month with a you know with a pr pretty pretty re pretty no I say reasonable I mean uh, Decent injury. I mean, pretty a pretty badly injured arm, and he was still out there the next month. How do we reconcile what you just said, that the guy who's most famous for being thrown off the cage and putting his body <laughs> through all of this tremendous torment and losing his ear and all this, I can't watch it. I can't watch it. <clears throat> because I think people watch the cell with a different frame of mind. I don't think anybody's laughing at the cell no. or just watching it. To I wasn't laughing when Sid broke his leg. Yeah, either, but... yeah. I just, uh, I just, I hate the word botch, you know, because it insinuates that if something's not done perfectly like a dance routine, that something's missing. And I don't believe wrestling should look like that. It needs to look like a struggle. Yeah, and I mean, Terry Funk would specifically put in things that didn't look like they were supposed to look. He reasoned that a back body drop shouldn't always look like a work of art. You know, uh, you know, you're charging somebody, he flips you, you're gonna go ass over tea kettle, not majestically sailing. I love the majestic backdrops. That's what we all aspired to do. We all aspire to take the Harley, Harley race backdrop. For my money, the best backdrop in the business now is AJ Styles. He's, he's somebody who takes the backdrop that, uh, you know, makes you catch your breath. Backdrops very rarely used these days, and that's a shame because the only move in anyone's offensive arsenal that requires the giver to bend down is a back body drop, and yet we rarely see a back body drop, but everybody's still bending down Wow! and getting caught with whatever move it might be, and I was like, to make it feel, to suspend disbelief, you've got to establish, just for the sake of it making sense the for all these other yeah. moves. 
you've got to establish the back body drop as a move that works, that people sell, that gets big pops, or else there's no reason for any of us to be bending over because there's no there's no objective to it. Yes. Have I become a cranky old man now? No, and that's great. <laughs> I'll be honest. I've never heard anybody talk about the importance of the backdrop yeah. and bending over. So, uh, But just going, I, I got off of that tangent because I was talking about the fact that Terry didn't think everything should look right. uh, perfect. And that I think, you know, my kids are using, oh, what a botch that was, what a botch. And when I was watching as a fan, uh, and I'm talking about 2015, 2016, uh, and I clearly, as a fan, had my favorites among the women. I didn't realize, wow, there are some powerful forces like opposing women's fans who are almost watching with glee anytime someone from the opposing camp makes a mistake. Yeah. So I would see like bots, 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 and I'm thinking, that looks like great wrestling to me. You know, yeah. I don't want, I love, I do like ice dancing, you know, I like that type pairs, figure skating, but that's not what ours is supposed to look like. Right. So Meltzer didn't describe uh, this as ice dancing. He says, something more closely approximating a major car wreck at the interstate than a pro wrestling match. Now this goes to uh, which match? Super Brawl. Super Brawl, okay, Super Brawl, the one where uh, where Knobs uh, gets hurt, okay. They did about as good of a job with a clumsy situation regarding Missy Hyatt in that she's been fired, but there's still many more months worth of pre-taped worldwide appearances. They explained she was at the Mayo Clinic getting her gums repaired, which is actually the funniest line of the show. Uh, Payne opened by suplexing both nasty boys out of their wrestling boots early until he was clipped at five minutes. Jack took a cold tag and ended up taking a totally psychotic nest tee plunge bump off the apron, cracking the back of his head on the concrete. He got his head ran into the guardrail. He came up bleeding from the mouth and somehow wound up with internal bleeding and was hospitalized after the match. It's been said before and it'll be said again, but nobody in wrestling works harder than people like Cactus Jack or Sabu. But it's one thing to do moves that risk injury. It's another to do moves that guarantee injury. Shivani at this point mentioned the Vader angle from last year and talked about how Jack lost his memory and came back, ignoring Jack's interview saying he never lost his memory. <laughs> Don't these people watch their own shows? Jack made a comeback, giving both men a DDT and tagged Payne, who did a suplex on Brian Knobs that looked like it could have broken his arm and his neck because of how bad of the landing, but it, quote-unquote, only dislocated his shoulder, although there was fear he may have broken his shoulder as well, and that would actually sideline him for several weeks. No worry to press time how serious the injury turned out to be or how long he'll be out of action. They had to go right to the finish at that point because Knobs was done, and Payne put Knobs in the Painkiller, which is the Fujiwara armbar, and Sags hit him with a guitar for the DQ. Three stars. A car crash of violence. Great way to describe it. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the Clash of the Champions maybe a, a few weeks before that where I hit Knobs and Sags uh, with the double clo cactus clothesline. So you talk about some serious tonnage going over that top rope. Oh, I, yeah. I was like the lean guy at three. <laughs> I, was, I was right about 300 at that time. And we were all probably about 300, 900 pounds, you know, give or take, you know, 1,000 pounds all hurtling over that top rope together. And I only did that move, uh, you know, maybe uh, I'd say the other craziest cactus clothesline was the one where I did it with Lita on my back and I clotheslined Edge. At WrestleMania 22, and that's where Lita and I had a talk. So you don't have to do this, um, but if you do it at a certain point, you have to just jump ship. Uh, do you think you can do that? Not a doubt in her mind. You know, I just got the little fuzzies there thinking about how badass that was because I'm not, I guess you, you could stretch the definition and say I, I was involved in a move that could have hurt a woman, but the intention wasn't there. Yeah. It's just, she's on my back, I see Edge, I'm gonna clothesline Edge, Lita happens to be on my back, and it all works out for the best. But that was a, that was a serious move, and that's one I was a little worried about. A lot of weight going over there. And now, uh, yeah, I'd say it was a, a three-star car crash, and uh, taking the Nest T plunge, you know, taking the Nest T plunge when I know there's no room for upward growth, I think you could argue that's not wise because that was Why one of the... Why do it? I don't know. don't know. 
I don't know. I'd have to, if I went through my entire career, I mean, I probably did that move 20 times. Wow. But probably 10 of those times was on the indies in but Memphis. Nobody saw. Going around the loop, doing it as a finish every night around the loop in Memphis, and finally saying to Robert Fuller, my back, I mean, it was purple and hideous. Like, I couldn't bump for about a month because I took that move three three out of four nights, and we get the same thing, Jacko. I said, Rob, I don't think I can do it tonight. And he looked at me and he said, Jack, it's probably a good decision. Man's only got so many bumps left in his body, there's not too many people out there. And he talked to me about the importance of saving that bump. So I would say if I took it 20 times, that 10 of them were in those small situations. And there were times when it did make sense. You know, I mean, I could say now, knowing we know about head injuries, I never should have done it because it's the, it's an, even if I got that ten, chin tucked to my chest, which I absolutely did, it's the rattling, you know, you are, all, it's like surviving a car crash. Yes. Boom, you're hitting, and I didn't realize it rattles your brain around inside your skull and jars you. A lot of the stuff, not, not a lot, but some of the stuff I did was just jarring in that way. But that Nesty plunge I did was something nobody else in the business uh, would do. And was your first one against uh, Mil Mascaras? No, no, no. First one would have been uh, 80, um, uh, probably 88. I'm, tr I'm trying to think if I'd taken it. I, it was at a spot show. Spot show for Memphis in front of maybe 200 people. How'd you come up with that idea? Uh, it, it, I wasn't planned. It was a, a tag, a six-man tag team, which is how you'd close a lot of the... Uh, the spot shows where you'd work a couple times, you'd work in a singles and come back and either the tag or six man. And when I took it, it was a gym floor. And I, I took it in a way where when I hit, my body was kind of slick at that time. I wore like the, the straps and not the shirt. And I kind of slid with the bump and it wasn't that bad. But then I took it, uh, you know, maybe a week or two later on concrete and oh. it just, I couldn't even conceive of anything that painful. That was the worst uh, at that point? That was the worst. But then when I took it in Memphis, the first time uh, Robert Fuller uh, got in the car and he was really concerned about how they could finish uh, the first match. Jeff had gotten Robert's loaded boot. You know, that loaded boot was a big deal in Memphis. And Jeff had gotten it. And Robert was going to pay the price, but they're looking at doing four weeks, six weeks, keep in mind, you know, you're running the same towns every single week. And he said, damn, I just don't want to be bleeding down to my shoes on the very first night. And I said, Rob, remember that bump you told me I might want to reserve for special occasions? He said, yeah. I said, I think this might be the special occasion. So here I am, I'm holding Jeff, you know, or, or I'm, I, I don't know if Jeff had the boot and was aiming for Robert, Robert ducks. Boom, I get it. I, um, I take the Nestie plunge, and I think Meltzer was there. I think there was some kind of fan convention going on. Not a convention, but a fan trip. And and I split the back of my head open, you know. And uh, that's where Robert uh, Fuller, who has uh, no official medical experience, but he's been around a lot of wounds. So when a guy like that, three time, third generation promoter, and oh, oh, damn, Jack, he says that. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like a big old pussy sitting on your head. Son, I don't know whether I should stitch it or, and then yeah. he offers the, ex, the second option. That was the night in Memphis. And so you think, all right, we take that item off the menu. And it's like, no, not so fast. Um, all the other cities ran a week later. You know, because the TV uh, delivery of the tapings. So we actually waited eight days to do it in um we did it. Well, we did it the next that coming Saturday night in uh, Nashville. Then we did it in Louisville. So by the time it comes to Evansville, Indiana, that Wednesday in front of like 120 people, I begged off. I said, I can't, I, I can't do it tonight. Um, the most famous one is probably the Clash. Yeah, yeah. That's I'd the say, first time I remember. Yeah, I'd say it. that's more famous. Even though I did it, I did it with uh, Taker in the Boiler Room Brawl. Yep. Uh, I did it with Rick in the I Quit match. Uh, I did it uh, at Spring Stampede. 
which we'll talk about. <laughs> and I did it out of you know necessity and desperation. That's there, your first mainstream. Yeah, first one. mainstream one where people saw that bump was Clash of the Champions against Mascaras. Uh, a Mill shows up only ten minutes before the show, <laughs> the show starts. He's either missed his plane or you know intentionally or unintentionally. And I go from thinking I'm going to get a singles win against Rick Fargo, who was my first tag team partner, to Mill being here. And all, you know, I've seen him work. I know he's hip toss, hip toss. He's going to get his stuff in. And all I ask is to get in this one spot, and I've got to kind of fight for it. So the spot is I'm going to give him the backbreaker out on the floor. But when I go up to the ring apron and my back is turned to him, he's going to roll underneath the rope. So when I go to turn around, there's nobody there. Now I go to drop my elbow, there's nobody there. I turn around, Mill, drop kick, off I go. Now I'll argue that Mill, he doesn't know me, so I don't guess he doesn't think he can trust somebody, you know, on a simple move like a backbreaker. So Mill basically... <laughs> Puts his hands down. Worst backbreaker yeah, ever. Yeah, it's the worst backbreaker ever, right? But I think the timing on the other part of the spot was good. Nobody uh, remembered the backbreaker. Yeah, and believable to when I turned around and I looked and there's nobody home, boom. And now here's where Corny keeps me alive. Yeah, Jack is dead. Jim Ross and Jim Cornette. And Corny, I think, was an uh, underheralded uh Color man. I thought he was really For sharp, sure. really good, but his first priority was always to get the talent over. And he gives that great line. You know, this is this is uh, 1990, so this is eight years before Hell in a Cell and Jay Hart as the immortal iconic call. You know, with God as my witness, he's been broken in half. But Jim Cornette at that time, Cactus Jack is dead. And now as I start the movie, he says, no man could get up from that, but he's doing it. No human being could get back up after that, but he's doing it. And now I, all I wanted to do was kick out. I wanted to kick out from that and then get beaten. And you know, I was I was overruled uh, by Rick. So uh, I was overruled. I thought that as one of their guys, uh, not just somebody who was coming in because it was Cinco de Mayo, I believe, um, and it was in Corpus Christi. Um, I, I thought that would be a, a good way, a good character builder. Overruled on that, and I did the, you know, did the favor. And then I, I lost another match to Wolf Wild, the drummer of the house band, who was J.T. Southern. So at the end of that night, uh, Tully's dad, um, <laughs> it was Blanchard. Joe? Joe Blanchard comes up, and he starts, like, taking off his, you know, work gloves because he was setting up the ring. He goes, well, I might as well take a shot at you. <laughs> You're owing to another loss isn't going to hurt you. He was putting me over. It's tremendous. But he was like, I couldn't even beat the drummer of a band, you know? Yeah. So it was, it, I'm so glad that I came out of it with a little bit of the spotlight. And that's solely because Jim Ross and Jim Cornette made me look like I was the star of that match, even when I was getting no offense in whatsoever. Is there a trick to taking the nasty plunge the right way? No. It's going to hurt no matter what. It's going to hurt no matter what. Yeah, I mean, you, well, if there's a trick, it's not a trick, you just, you need to land flat because if you land on your, say you land kind of lower back butt first, then That's you're going to have the whiplash effect. Uh, but there's no right way to, there's no wise way to do it. And given what it did to me, you know, internal bleeding, you know, it's internal bleeding was a sign you did it well, you know? So pee and blood was a good sign. Pee and blood. No, I'm talking about spitting it up. Oh, okay. Spitting it up um, was my sign. Wow, that had to look good. Uh, don't, please, for anyone out there, don't do it because it's not worth it. Antonio Noki was on the shelf for eight months to a year after, I think he inadvertently did it in a match with Hogan. Um, bad looking bump. It's a bad, mean, tough bump, and there is no. There's, um, there's no, no magic to concrete. There's no loophole. There's yeah. absolutely no loophole. So the rest of this match, though, my goodness, as if the Nesty plunge isn't enough, then, you know, they hit your head on the guardrail. And, I mean, it says here that that you're in the hospital afterwards. Do you remember this? I don't. I do not remember being in the hospital. It's, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I would... 
I mean, maybe they took me there as a precautionary measure because, you know, it's a, you know, corporate corporation. Uh, I don't remember being in the hospital. Would you bullshit your way if you did go to the hospital? Like, oh, I'm fine. I feel fine. Probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably. But I think if I'd gone there, I would, I am, yeah, I, I, you know, I remember when I was having trouble after taking those bumps in Memphis, uh, actually going to a chiropractor and, uh, and having some x-rays taken. At that time, he said that my spine didn't have the curve in the middle, that it was pushed forward, presumably, he thought, because of these bumps I described to him. Had he uh, seen them? Had the chiropractor seen, seen them? the bumps? No, because none of them were on TV. Yeah, okay. This episode of Foley is Pod is brought to you in part by AG1 from Athletic Greens, a product many of us have now started using literally every day. I wanted to see what all the hype was about and tried it about three weeks ago, and I absolutely love it. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It's kind of a mild tropical taste, and I actually look forward to it, but I wanted to know what it is. So what is it? With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adoptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. Again, I just wanted to see what all the hype was about and wondered, frankly, how it tasted. And I actually really enjoy the taste. I know uh, DDP and some others have been taking it every day and really, really enjoy it. Uh, AG1, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, gluten-free. Look, this contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything while still tasting good and it costs you less than three dollars per day and you're investing in your health it's cheaper trust me than your cold brew habit right athletic greens has over seven thousand five star reviews it's recommended by a ton of professional athletes and of course a bunch of the folks that you listen to here on our podcast right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition it's just one scoop and a cup of water every day that's it no need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health to make it easy athletic greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin d and five free travel packs with your first purchase all you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash foley again that's athleticgreens.com slash foley to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance athleticgreens.com slash foley so let's talk about this match uh more modern times here super brawl uh, you you sort of laid out that maybe the Nasties were upset with Max Payne. Does they go back through the curtain and it's a shouting match? No, she probably should have been, uh, because I know that Sags felt like it might have been intentional, like it might have been intentional, and they ribbed Max because Max, Max was a big, good-hearted guy, and the Nasties were ribbers. You know, I mean, they took it well, and you know, I mean, Sags got as good as he. Uh, Nobs, Nobs was more of the the verbal ripper. Uh, he got it as good as he gave it, and he enjoyed being in that role. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the things I wrote about in my book, the Tower New York Times number one bestseller, "Have a Nice Day," is that uh, we take the uh, the test, you know, for his testing uh, for drug test. And Nobbs, who was probably surprised that the plastic cup didn't melt when his uh, you know, urine hit it, <laughs> ends up testing positive, and he goes, oh, okay, what'd you get me for? And the guy goes, uh, anabolic steroids. And Nobbs just says right in front of the doctor, steroids? Steroids? And he takes off his shirt, and like he, you know, Arn Anderson says, he got the physiological makeup of a jellyfish. He goes, does it look like I'm on steroids? And the doctor takes his pen and writes, obviously there's been some type of mistake. (laughs) (laughs) Um, The Nasty Boys always strike me as a type, and I know they had their issues with Scott Hall when you weren't there and all that, but they always strike me as like old school guys where even if you did maybe take a liberty or something didn't go right, they're just going to stick their hand out and say, good match. And 
dot 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 i'll catch you down the road they came up through that uh, awa system you know which was that incredibly taxing uh training yeah regimen and so they went through it i mean they i remember coming and doing my event and while on one hand i sh never should have told the nasties to come and be my guests because i didn't you know they went, kind of went into the business on their own uh, and they gave a very interesting talk that would have been a great talk if it was an evening with the Nasty Boys. And I had Kane there as my guest, too, and neither one of us got to talk for about 25 minutes. But Sags and Knobs did take me and all the people in attendance through the rigors they had to endure. And they said it was Matt Millen. There was some connection with Matt Millen, the great football player. And Matt Millen was on the phone, whether it was with Vern or whoever the trainer was, Brad Rengens, whoever it was. And he was asking, and they said they saw his eyes like just going real wide. And Matt put down the phone. He said, you guys have to get in shape, like talking about getting in shape before they ever got there. So I think they trained for a year or so just to, just to endure what they had to endure with the AWA. I had no idea. They come out, they just look like a couple of brawlers. You know, they had that, what I think Meltzer called them strange charisma yeah you know and they had good matches they they were good characters i mean they had a great whether it was a one-year run in wwe they were great in wwe yes. right yes and they had good matches throughout their time in in wcw um the story about <laughs> dave schultz is uh he is the i don't think it's hyperbole say the most infamous enforcer of all time, or at least at that point he was. Um, the Broadway bullies are just legendary in Philadelphia. Dave Schultz is, he's coaching a, you know, a, a minor league hockey team, I think, in the area. But this is a big deal to have this guy as your enforcer. He's somebody who really means something, especially in Philadelphia. And so uh, I can see him, he's, he's out of his element. He doesn't feel completely comfortable, and he goes over to um, I think it's Sags who he's supposed to hit, you know, leading into the finish. And he says, um, maybe you guys can show me how to throw one of your punches. And Sags kind of looks and he goes, nah, just hit me as hard as you can. And he goes, if I hit you as hard as I can, I'm going to hurt you. And he goes, like I said, hit me as hard as you can. And I said, uh, Mr. Schultz, and he said, yeah, I said, uh, you are a legend here. We would not want to do anything that makes you look bad in front of this audience. I said, we're going to be out there pretty much swinging away. And so you need to do the same. And at that point, Schultz's <laughs> his nervousness ends. I believe he enjoys a beer or two. He enjoys talking with us. And now when that moment comes down and he has to go to work, on on sags it is clear that he has fully <laughs> grasped the lesson <laughs> and taken out to, maybe maybe above and beyond he pulls you know they always had the shirts right like you know we were all all cover up uh, yeah. aficionados right we all believe in the art of the cover-up so he pulls that shirt over sags his head and i mean brother when he's coming in with the uppercuts he's hitting them with everything he has he knocks him goofy and now I think there's a, you know, whatever move ends it after that comes in rapid succession. But it's Schultz uh, just throwing haymakers and connecting, knocking Sags goofy at his own request. And it's like, oh, I'm so proud to be part of this business. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um... And now just I don't know if we're going to revisit this match at another time. But this is my, my only gold that I had on, on that, you know, in WCW was that tag team gold. Yeah. My dad was at the match. Uh, a couple of my friends were at the match. Philadelphia, not too far from Long Island. And I remember Bischoff saying, that's the Mick Foley I want to see, or that's the Cactus Jack I want to see. Because I had been down, you know, I had been down. And um, as we'll probably talk about, you know, I was thinking I was going to get surgery to repair the... the uh, uh, the lost ear and then I got called back into action or asked if I would go back into action 
and Kevin and I had that great match with the Nasties, uh, and it was it was it was one for the ages. Trying to live up to what we did at Spring Stampede, yeah. So man. and we we will. There's a lot to live up to, as you and I, I guess, we're gonna talk about. The Nasty Boys, though, such a guilty pleasure of mine. I love this match. Uh, and you know what? They they love the fact. I don't think I ever see them when they don't quote the book where they say the Nasties were sloppy and dangerous, but they knew how to brawl. Like they, like they were the guys who would hit you in the rib. You know, they might catch you in the ribs. You know, instead of the stomach. You know, uh, I guess anything that I, I probably owe <laughs> Knobs an apology to this day for the fact that I took a fan's so bo- you know soda bottle, not a bottle, you know, big thirty-two ounce uh, soft drink or beer, and I think I'm throwing beer in Knobs' face, and the, the guy goes, "No, like no," I was like. Come on, dude. It's only beer. You can order another one. And I'm in mid-fling when I see this brown, brown liquid it's tobacco. en route, and it's chewing tobacco. And it's like knobs. <laughs> Looks like the recipient of the worst money shot in the history of adult film if the money shot was brown in color. Just, It's just... <laughs> it looks like a sn- snowman that's melting, you know. Oh. And so to this day, yeah, sorry, my bad on that one. <laughs> wow, well, that's gross. Uh, the other channel, you've got WrestleMania 10 happening at Madison Square Garden. Two of the greatest Mania matches ever. Brett and Owen get us started. And boy, Sean and Razor just stole the show with the ladder match. Yeah. Are you keeping up with what's happening on the other channel? A little bit, yeah, as much as we can. I don't know if we had the, uh, we no, certainly no DVRs. I right. guess you could record things. Yeah, VHS, yeah. You could record on VHS. You're catching stuff whenever you can. Uh, I'm. We're not always working on a Monday night, so I'm, I'm watching Monday Night Raw whenever I can. Watch the Saturday Superstars whenever I can. So I'm aware of what's going on. I'm reading uh, two newsletters at that time. Torch and Observer. Torch and Observer. Um, and so I'm, at the very least, reading about it. Uh, I don't think I saw that ladder match. Uh, so I can't, I don't believe I saw that mania for years after. Man, they made magic that night. And kind of, there have been other, there have been other ladder matches. I guess Brett and uh, Dynamite had set the bar pretty high, especially with, uh, you know, feats of daring. And then, but Scott and Sean just told such an incredible story that night at the garden, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, it, it feels like that would have been right up your alley. You know, the, um, the use of, 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 of props and, 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 and height. And I don't know, it just, it felt like something you would have said, okay, I can get behind. Yeah. That. I don't know if I can hang with the modern day practitioners of the ladder matches because there's such such great athleticism. Yeah. You know, I had a few good ladder matches in my day. And even at Mania with me and Funk in 98, Billy Gunn and I took a really cool dual bump off yeah. the ladder into the dumpster, which certainly felt a lot higher at the time than it looked. You know, and you're crashing down, you hope you're going to make it. You know, there's not much room for error because if you don't make it right into the middle of that thing, you could get your head dinged, yeah. could get your knees banged up. And so we were both glad to have been in uh, in one piece. And then, of course, we, uh, we, we'd we be remiss if we didn't mention between Super Brawl and Spring Stampede, this is where you lose the ear in Germany. Uh, oh, it's between. Oh, wait, are you sure I didn't? Oh, between Spring Stampede and Super Brawl. Yes. Okay, 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 gotcha. So uh, check that out in the archives. We've already covered that. But in your mind, when the ear comes off, I mean, there's no way you want to miss a pay-per-view, right? right? Now, in this area, you're not getting necessarily pay-per-view bonuses, are no, you? No, But it's just a point of pride. This is a pay-per-view. I want to be on it. More of a point of pride, yeah, that you're not going to miss, uh, you're not going to miss a pay-per-view because of this, especially because I was so excited about the prospects of, uh, of uh, having that capitalized on. And I really enjoyed working with Max. You know, I understood we've talked in the past episode about the ebbs and flows. Yes. I don't need to be on the top of the card all the time. This is a good spot. Uh, we have good chemistry with these guys, but surely the company's going to do something about this. And so I'm on a real down. And, and it also, just physiologically, it was explained to me now your body is not what it was because right. part of it's gone. So you have, it's very common to have, to just suffer depression 
following that because you are almost like mourning the loss of part of yourself. Right. Uh, as crazy as that sounds. Does it uh, also affect your equilibrium? A little, yeah, it did a little bit. It did a little bit. And I remember I was keeping a journal at that time, and the journal, yeah, it was kind of a downer, you know? Yeah, I wasn't as fun to be around, and I was always, you know, for my younger kids, wow, I was always the dad who wanted to do stuff, and then I become the dad who was laying in bed all day. So I, I think it was a combination of the physiological aspect of losing your ear, but probably more so the idea that they're, they're not going to do anything with me. You're right, you're right. You know. Um, and the other channel... Um Boy, it's not all roses up there either. So I could see why you maybe felt like, man, this isn't working out the way I hoped. Because in the middle of you losing your ear and they're not doing anything with it, and you feel like, oh, this is probably not the perfect spot for me. Vince McMahon's on trial for steroids. And at that point, all the other territories are pretty much gone. You know, mm -hmm. You've got some small little independent promoters here or there. But as far as making a full-time living in wrestling... If you can't do it in WCW and you can't do it in the WWF because maybe things are changing there with maybe events going away, you have to, at least in the back of your mind, be thinking, is my dream slipping away, right? You have, you have ways to make a living in Japan. Um, guys are still going to Puerto Rico. ECW is a thing and it's on the rise. I can't remember if it was under Eddie Gilbert then or whether when Paulie. Paul, Paul was doing it Paul, by then. Okay, Paul was doing it by then. But uh, especially when you know the other company's not interested in you, it is, in Bill Watts's word, a buyer's market. Yes. And I'm a seller, and I have nowhere else to sell my goods. Um, but I'm aware that independents are doing, are out there. And I think, you know, based on the fact that I was making 250 a night in 1990, my spot's a lot better. Independent promoters know I'm going to come in and I'm going to give them the best match I can. Yeah. Uh, and I believe I can make five hundred dollars a night. So I'm going to be, you know, a grand, a grand a week instead of three grand a week. But I'm doing it on my own, and I'm finding some place to do it away from the cameras of WCW. That was a uh, uh, that was it. Definitely entertaining that thought. Uh, all I'd say largely because of the failure to follow up on what I thought was. A gimme. Yeah, a gimme, which is the missing year in wrestling. Talking about Vince, though, were you concerned that, hey, if Vince goes down, that's going to be damning for the whole industry? Sure, yeah. I mean, on, on some level, I'm sure some people would say, oh, well, it could be an opportunity for WCW, but I tend to think if Vince really went under, man, that yeah. could have been catastrophic for the whole industry, right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, we needed Vince, and guys needed guys in WCW needed uh, another place to go, for the sake of you know I I always detested that term buyer's market. Yeah, you know like we're soybeans, or uh, <laughs> pork bellies, so I never liked that, and I always liked the idea, and still do that. There's some place for the guys, men and women, to go. So let's talk about the way these matches are put together because we're going to do our very first watch along here on Folius Pod in just a few minutes but we've heard in prior episodes that agents weren't as involved back then no. as they were now do you have to run stuff past I mean is this all just everybody figures it out when they see it or are you at least saying we might do this we might do that man that's a good question because I don't remember there being agents in WCW, I know we talked last week about Paul Orndorff, you know, being uh, an agent of sorts. I don't remember guys coming to you and talking to you about your matches. So this is supposed to be my last match before I go out to pasture and get the uh, the ear fixed. Right. And I'm pretty down, down to the point where I take that walk from the Clarion Hotel uh, across the parking lot of uh, the venue uh, there in the outside of Chicago. Rosemont Horizon is what yeah. it was called at that time. And probably one of just a few arenas that you could leave your hotel and walk across the, the uh, uh, parking lot to go to. And I see a camera crew in front of us, and whether it was uh, Access Hollywood, it was something along those lines. They want to talk about Missy Hyatt suing WCW. And Max Payne says, uh, 
uh, there are avenues you have to go through, PR department, I say, what do you want to know? And I just, I guess there's all these emotions going through my body, you know, uh, loss of the ear physically, the mentally, and also an idea, part of me thinks I'm doing this in character as part of the company. And I say the line, if you can make, you can dig into Ted Turner's deep pockets, go ahead and do it. And then I think I hit a character line uh, it's about our past angle with Missy. And uh, the next day I got that call from Eric Bischoff, whether it was the next day or two days later, did you <laughs> do an interview where you encouraged Missy Hyatt to reach into Ted Turner's deep pockets? And it was like it was like one of those dreams you wake up from and not sure if you're dreaming. Like it's like, I think I did. Yeah, I think I. You know, that's clearly a corporate no no. Yeah. Right. To encourage uh, disgruntled talent to uh, reach into to Ted's deep pockets. Yeah. I just I thought I was in character. I can 100% see how that was not news that was received <laughs> favorably. But even when we get into the building. I'm just by myself. I remember giving a promo that for a news outlet and a big boss man like going, whoa, uh, yeah, Sam, like, are you going through, through some stuff? Because it was a real sullen down. It was an in-character promo, but the content was surprising. Couldn't tell you what the content was. But I don't know if we talked for more than 30 seconds about that match. We didn't set up a bunch of cool stuff. Were you at least, uh, I only asked because you, you made it a point to talk about the right angle to shoot that elbow off the apron. Right. Were you, at, were you giving some sort of heads up to a cameraman? That night? Um, well, just in general, in WCW, would you say, now listen, Jackie, if you don't mind. Yeah, Jackie Crockett was yeah. great with that. He took the low angle, angle shot that I suggest and he added the shake to it. So it looks like uh, not only am I flying into your living room, but I am uh, rocking You're rumbling the, the, in there. the foundation. Um, I, th I would, and I was seen as something of a pain in the neck. By, I, I, Jesse didn't seem to care for my, you know, and J, JR didn't seem to care for it either. JR had his own, you know, he was in there, no one was locked in more. And I'm not, that's the same me, it didn't seem to care. Okay, I got it, I got it, I got it. You know, when I was trying to tell them what we're trying to get across. Um, Wait, Jesse and JR would cut you off? No, no, this is back, when I would say this is what I'm trying to do, I got the feeling that you, they both like to do things, uh, you know, their way and, uh, I, look, I'm not looking for this to be controversial, but Jim was very much, he seemed very much. Here's what we did. He, you know, he was in his head, no one ever did it better. That was his oh, for process. Sure. You know, um, I don't remember uh, the announcers at that time saying, hey, what are you trying to get across here? Is there any move that we should be looking for? And so we're going to watch along. I, yes. I'll be surprised. I, I haven't seen this match in 20 years. Uh, but it was a match that came alive right in front of me because it was one of those things that I just wanted to get through. Like I said, very little, if any, talking about spots. Uh, and then within the first two minutes, I realized, and I can probably be quoted from my own book, that if I don't start fighting back, these guys are going <laughs> to really injure me. I think it was, you know, a non-gimmicked pool cue over the head. Uh, it's a car crash. I can't uh, yeah. wait for us to watch. But a much more enjoyable car crash. I think this was a four-star car crash. This is an unbelievable yeah. performance. Yeah. Uh, before we watch, though, I don't think the internet and just wrestling fans at large really talk about Jackie Crockett enough. It feels like everybody uh, is quick to talk about Jim Crockett Jr. and, of course, his brother David, who was a big part of yeah. the old uh, championship wrestling programming that we saw at 605. But Jackie Crockett was really like the unsung hero mm -hmm. because he had a great mind for the business and he knew, based on everything I understood about Jackie, exactly uh, how to showcase the guys yeah. best with the camera. Uh, what was your experience with Jackie? I love Jackie. Yeah, he was really re receptive to ideas. Like I said, he'd take a, what I thought was a great idea, make it even better. And that elbow became a hallmark of what I did, you know, when both my runs there in WCW, so he was a great guy, and he was a, he was an easy guy to talk to, 
I didn't really have a relationship with Jim or David. I knew Jackie, I liked Jackie. You know, he felt like one of the boys, even though he was production. Um, when you and I were listening in a while back to Vince McMahon on the Pat McAfee show, and he's telling, uh, talking about some of the cameramen better 15, 20 years, I'd say some of them have been there 25 years. Or more. You know, or yeah. more. You go in, you see a few of the same faces, man, and uh, you know they're really good guys because you know they're going out of their way. On one hand, they're doing their their job, but on the other hand, they're taking such great pride in making you look as good as you possibly can. I mean, Stu was probably there when you started. Yeah, wasn't he? yeah, still He's there, still, still there, Stu from Cincinnati. It's amazing. Yeah. What do you think about it? I remember Stu asking my my daughter. He he told me later. He said he asked my daughter, "What was it like growing up in a house where you?" kind of celebrated Christmas all year long, and my daughter went, oh, it was amazing. <laughs> That's such an awesome yeah. answer. This episode is brought to you by CarShield, who makes it easy and affordable to protect my car from expensive repairs. And that's just for starters. CarShield is the number one auto protection company in the U.S. and offers protection plans for around 100 bucks a month. The plans cover more parts than ever before, whether your car has 5,000 miles or 150,000 miles. Let me tell you how simple it is to get your car fixed. When you need a repair, you choose Choose the mechanic, and CarShield's administrators handle the rest. That's it. You don't have to deal with the paperwork or headaches. You're taken care of. Same goes if your car breaks down and you're stuck on the side of the road. Plans through CarShield also include coast-to-coast -coast roadside assistance. CarShield administrators are there for you with rental car options and trip reimbursement at no extra cost too. Get coverage today and you'll lock in your price now and it will never go up. That means as long as you own your car, no matter how old it is, you're protected from the rising cost of parts and repairs for your vehicle. CarShield helps protect my wallet from expensive car repairs and they'll do the same for you. Go to carshield.com slash podcast to start your plan and lock in your pricing forever that's carshield.com slash podcast a deductible may apply are you feeling stuck making minimum payments on your credit card debt SaveWithConrad.com can help, and you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Oh, and did I mention no house payments for two months? Get rid of your credit card debt and lower your monthly payments right now at SaveWithConrad.com. Uh, okay, so we're going to get everybody to um, to fire up their peacock machines. We're going to a Spring Stampede first Season 1, Episode 1. Uh, and as we're waiting for everyone to get set, the first match featured Johnny B. Bad against your old friend DDP. And then Steve Regal goes to a 15-minute draw with uh, Brian Pillman. And now we're going to watch an all-out brawl. So as you're watching at home with us, it's Spring Stampede Season 1, Episode 1. We're going to go to 36 minutes and 17 seconds. That's where we're going to get our time cue from. All right, so as a reminder, we're uh, on Peacock, Season 1, Episode 1. Uh, of Spring Stampede here, and your time code again is 36 minutes and 17 seconds. That's 36 minutes, 17 seconds. I'm going to do a bit of a countdown, uh, and then when uh, when I say play, you're going to press play. And Mick, this will be the first time you've seen this match in a long time. That's right. I'm going to put the glasses on so I can better absorb it. Okay, well, here we go. Uh, three, two, one, play. Great shot there of the backdrop. Nicely done. The big curtain. And here come the nasty boys. <laughs> Sporting the tag straps. Brian Knobs has his Rambo headband on. <laughs> Jerry Sachs has a kendo stick. Oh, Brian does too. The Sandman's influence is felt even here in 94. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Was he using it in 94? I think he was. Or we'll have to look and see when the, when the kendo stick became the Singapore cane. Yes. Right after the international incident took place in Singapore. Where this, we want this to be educational too, right? Absolutely. So going not. back, there's a young man who stole some gum in Singapore, which is a no-no. He was supposed to take 10 lashes with a cane. Uh, Paul Heyman jumped in that immediately and turned it kendo stick into the singapore cane how about two signs for cactus jack so for nice, the nasty right? boys or cactus toys and now then a friend cactus. of mine came over from japan uh masa uh oh man he, 
Uh, from, from BTE, Fat Ass Masa? No, no, not B, uh, no, Fat Ass. Uh, uh, Masa Hori. He, friend, uh, ever, uh, Jericho even said, if you've been to Japan and you haven't uh, met Masa, you, you're not shit, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so Masa had shown up at a WCW taping with a uh, super, super dad. dad that's me. Is here. All Pajama top. Up. That's right. And I got, I'm, I'm, I'm nursing the missing ear. Again, this is supposed to be my last match before I go out to pasture to have my ear reattached to my head. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, my, oh, here we go. Another, look Jack, at all these. Here's to you, Cactus. All right, there's, he's, he's going already to broken a Singapore cane over you. Already. So no pool cue? Why did I think there was a pool cue? Maybe that was a pool cue. My goodness. There's a lot of tonnage hitting that ground. Max went about, he was about 6'6", 400 pounds. Great he said amateur he was an player. amateur wrestler. Yeah, him. great amateur wrestler. There's yeah. a, There it is, right? That's a yeah. pool cue, right? That's a pool cue. Okay. And this is where I realize if I don't, whether or not I want to be there, if I don't start fighting for my life, these guys are going to kill me. If not kill me, then, you know, just make me look bad because uh, they thrived on the give and take. All right, that's probably the weakest offense we'll see. And he <laughs> oh, now it's your turn with the full cue. Oh, good. Got some cowboy boots on. Yeah, there. I don't know what. I don't even remember owning those cowboy boots. And these are the uh, the trademark Foley sweats. <laughs> <laughs> Love those sweats, man. Street fight. You got to show up in Why your street not? fighting yeah. gear, right? All right, I think we have a big clothesline coming up. Oh man. Oh, it looks Bang nice, that right? hip or that thigh. And I sat on the apron, so I didn't make full contact with my thighs like I usually did. That is not the way you normally swing a chair, but Brian's, I mean. He got him flat. Jay got Sags flat, don't yeah. care. Those chairs could be difficult. Those are the ones you have to slide up from the back. All right, nice bump on uh, for knobs on my behalf. Oh, Appreciate taking the that. camera guy down here, too. Oh, yeah. But it's not a gimmick pool cue. It's no, really it's not rocking. a gimmick pool cue, and he's not pulling those shots. Uh, there'd be welts across my back after that for sure. Chair shots for everybody. Yeah, chair shots in the back. Nothing special. But still. <laughs> it just clobbers you from behind. <laughs> a rare shot of the Foley torso. There, again, pushing. That'd be worth money these days. 300 pounds these, uh, at that time. Maybe even a little heavier, 310. I tell you, from the side, Max Payne looks like a heavy set canyon. <laughs> Does, right? Yeah. Max is a good dude, man. How is he as a guitar player? He was good, very good. And he had a band uh, that, you know, with Road Dog as their. Oh, there we go. He had a band with Road Dog as the lead singer, uh, Doctor Squash. Remember, I told the Steve Miller story yeah. last week. Uh, he had a band. I think that was poised to take off, and it, it never did. So, what did you think of the ramp? We just saw the interaction. I love the ramp, um, man. Yeah, a, a lot of guys t would do some cool stuff on that ramp, and it was a good way to, t to take even a normal move like a backdrop and really make it meaningful. And uh, it was cool when someone went out there to do something and immediately, uh, it immediately looked special. I heard uh, managers, I think maybe Jim Cornette specifically, said he hated the ramp because you couldn't work around all four sides. Uh, that's enough, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess there were pluses and minuses. And if you're a manager, yeah, you can't circle the, the you can't circle the ring like uh, you might like to. You can't prowl it. This is the era where blood is a no-no, right? Bl yeah, absolutely. Because if blood wasn't a no-no, we would we have had four guys here. bleeding right now. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. The clothesline with the pool cue, I like that. Again, all this stuff is off the cuff. Uh, now, not this, not this because spot. I this realize, up, yeah, yeah, we are going to have the uh, the fake concession stand brawl. Uh, but it looks like a place you could conceivably <laughs> That's buy slow. merchandise from if you hop over a guardrail. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Memphis and Tupelo. Uh, yeah, the, the the Tupelo concession stand brawl kind of it set the bar high. So we're going with the fake concession stand brawl. But I think the stuff we're doing is good enough and believable enough where people are okay. I'll believe for a moment that if you want a T-shirt, you could do that at this juncture. Hop over the guardrail and buy it. All right, there's a stiff one to the head. 
stiff chair shot to the head. And I like the fact that they're using two different cameras. Got to pull down that shirt, no matter how much pain you're in. <laughs> The, the two camera shots, it's almost, it's got to be a little disheartening as a performer, though, because you're taking these violent bumps, yeah, and they might not be watching. Right, and so I'm glad that they're doing it. We were reprimanded afterwards uh, by Greg Gagne. For? For uh, fighting in areas where the fans couldn't see, and I said, Greg, we're on television, though. Yes. And he said, yeah, but for the fans in the arena, you know, you, you're killing the town. I was like, I don't think we're killing the town with this match. So that looks like an extra gimmick to table, right? Yeah, there. yeah. Well, you could argue See the that, underpinning that uh, that any uh, any table uh, knobs is placed on is going to give way. Oh, he's <laughs> stuffing! Is that a nasty boy shirt? He's stuffing it! Oh my goodness! The only way it could be worse is if it was an Al Snow shirt. <laughs> well done. Who would have thought, too, that after all this that you guys are putting yourself through, sadly, the first person that we would lose in our wrestling family here is Pee Wee the Pee -wee, referee. Yeah, Pee Wee from Cancer. Yep. You just assume, boy, these guys yeah. here. Because, man, the nasties, the, the nasties live life large. And uh, Nobbs is having a tough time physically now. All right, what are, I guess I'm doing this. Oh, man. Yeah, Over the yeah. guardrail, onto the concrete. That couldn't have felt good. It's a simple call. Reverse it, you know. Again, uh, you just have to take my word for it. There's very little, if anything, set up. Uh, oh, no, I'm not saying Max set. didn't go over some things. Uh, I don't know about that. I just know from my perspective, everything is new because I wasn't part of any conversations. Oh, it just hit you with the table leg. <laughs> not just the table, but the leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was doing like a seesaw thing on you. Here. Yeah, it's per pretty solid looking blow, sir. <laughs> yeah, the edge of the table. Yeah, that's a pretty good looking little, little spot. Now he's going. Oh, so he's going to set this up. Is I believe the finish is going is designed to be a pile driver on top of the uh, table, and you will see an impromptu ad lib. I call an audible when uh, the table doesn't cooperate with us. And what a show this was. I mean, this is the same show we've got Ric Flair and Ricky Steamboat again. And, oh, swing and neck breaker on the ramp. At the same time, Knob goes through the other panel. Now we're setting up the table on the ramp here. Oh, we're going to suplex it. Yeah, this was a fully original. I don't think anyone ever suplexed the table before I did it. Bam! Did you come up with that just freestyled right there? Uh, I may have done it a time or two before that. I think I had because I remember doing it to Chris Candido at Peel's Palace in Erlanger, Kentucky. Uh, oh. Was that for Smoky Mountain? Yeah, but Smoky Mountain may have actually come. Ah, man. Oh, here comes the shovel. This is brutal. Oh, I remember this. Oh, man. So we got the big snow shovel here. Max stops Brian Knobs from using it. Now he's using it on Knobs. Now watch this table start Knobs shaking. Look at the table shaking and boom! It just collapses under the weight. And so now I've got to call. Look, there's not enough room for me to take this bump of the nasty plunge properly. So I end up doing great damage to my shoulder because I've got to rotate in midair. I call the spot, just push me backward. Boom, here we go. And oh. bam! So I landed on the right-hand side. You have to go flat. Not enough room to go all the way back, but as far as uh, plan Bs go, I think it's pretty good. I, th I feel like I'm done, and now... <laughs> Sags jumps on you, knobs throws a shovel Shovel, you. and now watch me turn my face so that I don't get hit in the, uh, the nose. There we go, hit turn it. Boom. God dang. Turn it so I don't get hit in the nose or the uh, teeth. And that one's over. And I believe I'm going to be on an extended absence to uh, reattach my ear. My goodness. What a performance. And we're not yeah. done. There's the photographer nice Linda before. Rufa, who was a mainstay and a cool person. 
are you thinking right there? Man, I'm thinking I'm glad it's over. And my underwear's showing, right? Yeah, it sure yeah. is. Sure is. Should have gone with a singlet underneath. Didn't Pat used to say yellow on the front, brown in the back? Wasn't that the idea? <laughs> with those tidy whities <laughs> So, uh... You're just wanting to get this over with. You're yeah. ready to scrape me off the mat and send me home. And it is over. And we realize it's been really, really good. You know, uh, I was about 12 minutes. Well, what's, what's Nick Patrick saying there in real life? He's asking if I'm okay. Yeah. And he's probably saying, man, that was, he's pro- I think he's saying, brother, I've never seen anything like that. Did you feel like you needed a stretcher or did you feel like you could do it? No, I felt like I could get up. For the purposes of a story, would you have rather have been a stretcher? Well, if uh, if the idea was I'm taking uh, uh, three months off to get my ear reattached, uh, maybe there should have been a stretcher. Meltzer called it one of the wildest, sickest, most brutal matches you'll ever see. Um, they traded brutal chair shots. Jack took his usual psychotic bumps in what will apparently be his last match for several months as he's expected to undergo surgery to reattach his ear. Uh, they talked about the whole uh, fake concession stand, but <laughs> Payne went to pile drive one of the guys through a table, but with about 700 pounds of combined weight, the table broke before he so could set up the Payne was actually Sags trying it to pile drive yeah. me, right? Yep. Jack finally took the sickest nasty plunge bump off the ramp onto the concrete, sounding like a watermelon was being splattered on the concrete. Sags then used the shovel and gave Jack what looked to be a shot to, to the head, far too brutal for words, and got the pin. After the match, the Nasties knocked out Payne by destroying the table over him. One of the most brutal matches of all time. Four and a half stars. Nice, right? I mean, you... You haven't seen that match in a while. What did you think watching it back? I, you- yeah, I really liked it. Really enjoyed it. I think it's deserving of its uh, legendary status there. I uh, love the idea that not much was talked about. And I, and I really appreciate the idea that I came in not caring and was made to care in a hurry. Seriously, those guys, you know, like... Uh, they were great. Look, when I did the thing uh, with the with the chewing tobacco, that was in Marlboro, Maryland, and I remember Harley getting on. Uh, I remember him, you know, going to curse twice in a single show. He was like, uh, somebody said, "Man, they're going to need uh, a cleaning crew to, after this match," and Harley said, "They need somebody to clean up the shit in the ring." <laughs> Because he thought we were doing too much Gaga. Yeah. And it was too funny. And he you know, had a little talk with me about maintaining a sense of, you know, like pride while we were out there and not just do, doing silly stuff and throwing tobacco in a guy's eye. Uh, so they, you could have fun with those guys. But when it was time for business, they, they took it really seriously. And again, if I hadn't have upped my game in a hurry, I would have gotten swallowed up. And uh, it would have been a really tough night for me. And it was a tough night anyway. And that injury uh, really severely bruised my shoulder. And a deep. An ST plunge? Yeah, yeah, because I didn't land flat. And there'd be one other time I didn't land flat. And that was uh, one other time prior. That was 91 for my All Japan tour against uh, Jumbo Saruta. And I ended up breaking three ribs and wearing a flak jacket for months. And even when I got into WCW in 91, I remember at that time, the, uh, the, the philosophy or principle of healing a rib injuries, you had to have compression to push those ribs together. And now it's recognized that what you're doing is you're opening yourself up for pneumonia because you're not allowing your lungs to expand. Yes. But I had that compression thing on my around my ribs for months at a time. I remember riding with Abdullah. I never missed a match. Uh, but there were times when I was really hurting, and there was a few months. Again, I didn't miss a match because of the broken ribs, but they didn't heal up for a long... It's hard to heal up when you're working a physical style. Yeah. You're not taking time off. Uh, so there's two injuries with the... Sand, and that's not even including the, the back of the head and the wounds and the rattling that we talked about internally and shaking up your brain. Um, so very little margin for error in a move that even if you do correctly is going to cause you a world of pain. But that was the first time I'd ever taken a pain pill was in after that a day or two punch. after that. And I immediately recognized uh, the, uh, 
uh, I'm trying to, euphoric property, mm -hmm. right? And that was, wow, I, I, I never felt this way before. How many hours do I have to wait before I can take another one? And I'm glad I had that experience because I was like, all right, I see why people get hooked on this. So I'm gonna take this week or whatever it is and then uh, away you go. And I don't know if I had another pain pill until, uh, yeah, I believe when I hurt my back in, uh, in ECW, in August of 94, uh, yeah, some one of the boys gave me one, and uh, uh, then it was uh, may maybe Hell in a Cell. So. so looking back at that, the nasty plunge is what you remember doing the most damage, but the shovel to the face, scale of yeah. 1 to 10, where are we at on that? Well, I mean, Sags always talks about the fact, and Knobs does too, they lift that thing and I just go... You didn't see me do, well, I should have done that, right? That's a natural reaction, boom. And I know I'm with guys who aren't gonna be holding back on it, right? And so all I ask is, man, you know, you, tur you, know, you turn your head, why? Because you don't want your nose. Hit it your flat. Yeah. And they hit me flat. I personally thought the Nesty plunge was enough for the fall. Yeah. Uh, Sags had other, um, other ideas. So that wasn't worked uh, out ahead of time. No, none of that was because uh, the only thing we knew was the finish. And again, maybe I'm looking back, you know, that this through rose-colored glasses, but it's my recollection. And I think that's uh, consistent with what I wrote in 1999 that I didn't have anything planned. Uh, maybe Max and those guys did, but I was already in my head uh, out of the company and getting uh, surgery. Meltzer, uh, or not Meltzer, you would write. Jerry Sags broke a pool cue over my head, and Brian Knobs nearly dented my skull. The nasties were sloppy as hell, and a, and more than a little dangerous, but they knew how to brawl. About a minute into this thing, I realized I better start fighting or I'm gonna get killed out here. About three minutes in, I realized we were in the midst of something pretty special. Sags attempted to pile drop me on the table for the finish, the table buckled under our weight, and we crashed to the ramp. As I got up, Sags pushed me and I fell backwards off the five foot ramp onto the cold, hard concrete below. I didn't land flat, however, and I knew my shoulder was injured, but at least I'd earned the, uh, the right to rest, right? Not quite yet. <laughs> Sags hopped down off the ramp and I winced when I saw Knobs throw him a scoop <laughs> shovel. It was plastic, but I knew this crazy bastard swinging is just gonna hurt just the same. He raised the shovel high overhead, almost like an ax, and I remembered what Dominic Danucci had taught me about protecting our teeth and nose, and I turned my head to the side. Sags proceeded to hit me about as hard as another human being could, but at least I'd be out of WCW. Yeah. Big relief. Did you think that was your swan song? Yeah. I mean, I thought I might come back, but this would give me a chance to get out of what I thought. You know, it was a negative atmosphere. Um, have that ear reattached, and had it not, there were two factors led to my uh, return, so I never actually left. The two factors were uh, Dave Sullivan was injured, and mm -hmm. Kevin needed a new partner for the next month, and also the phone call from Eric Bischoff, letting me know that I had uh, encouraged Missy to uh, reach into Ted's deep pockets. So I believe the Sullivan phone call came on the same afternoon and uh you wrote in your book man you think i would have learned by now right i was awakened two days later by the sound of a telephone it was kevin sullivan <laughs> two days after this two days after brother <laughs> yeah he just encouraged me to give it one more go have one more match was it where you uh why were you so agreeable? Why weren't you a harder sell? You just had a soft spot for Kevin, or you secretly just really wanted it? I didn't really want it, but I was also I was also on a post match high, you know, remembering how good this stuff could feel afterwards. That's that's the thing I miss most about wrestling is that post match, that time you spend together, uh, you know, and it's just crazy thing because you know the, the four was just beating the hell out of each other. Yeah, wasn't the same. You know, w when uh, Nobbs was injured, obviously there's no post match high when you're worried about one of the guys. Uh, but to spend that time and realize he just done something really cool in my mind too. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to 
be off for a while. I'm yeah. going to be home with my kids, which is the thing I love most of all. Um, so Sullivan, it was there was a definite yearning for me to do the right thing by Kevin because he had been so instrumental in my character in 1990. And I knew we worked together well. And uh, I did like, I did enjoy working with the Nasties. And there was a feeling that, uh, you know, we could, uh, we could do something. In hindsight, um, would you have done anything differently with the match? Or are you pleased with it? I was really happy with it. In hindsight, I probably would have been uh, more present mentally beforehand. But they weren't guys who liked to go over spots anyway. Right. You know, I don't know how much we had planned the next month. You know, a lot of it's just give and take. And you're fine. You know, they're bringing something out with them. But it's not like we were going under the ring to pull out bizarre objects. Right. You know, we're kind of using what's around us. And I say that as, you know, three minutes of the match take place at a fake concession stand. So And, and there's a pull cue and a scoop shovel. Yeah, but these are things you could, con yeah. you know, whether they brought them out, they had them. But uh, I thought it was a great job of us utilizing what you had around you. Um, I think since that time, we've seen many a brawl that's even wilder. Um, well, because that really set, you know, and, and you and I know it's a tribute really to Tupelo, but a lot of fans would see that happen in ECW, and then when anybody else on TV did it, it's like, oh, they're ripping off ECW. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you guys were doing that long before Yeah, ECW. I think so. Yeah, and uh, Rotten Ron Starr had taught me how to brawl around buildings and uh, – 89 so i'd say we predated uh you know my affinity for brawling around buildings predated ecw sure you know when i and uh, joel goodhart's tri-state wrestling was the yeah. precursor of ecw of course and uh the wild matches i had with eddie gilbert you know i think uh stand the test of time and eddie was such a oh so instrumental and again along with my wife believing in me i think having that angle with eddie gilbert uh, was a real big factor in me believing that I could deliver a, at the top of the card. It's interesting to see the choices of the weapons, and you can sort of tell what the guys picked versus what the company did. That that table they had set up for Brian Knobs <laughs> was it was ready to collapse right away. The thing is, you know, here's I love Richie Posner, the Magic Man. Sure. But anytime you ask a, the gimmick guy, the chances are not anytime, but they're prone to over gimmicking. Yes. And they're so, trying to be helpful. They're trying to be helpful. Uh, like when I had the match with Triple H, uh, Hell in a Cell, and I throw the stairs, uh, it's, I'm envisioning the mesh starts to give, like a chunk, like a corner gives way, so that when I hit it with my shoulder, which is where the, the blood comes from, I really have to run through that thing. And really, I could have just stepped right through it, because that thing went through, the, the stairs went through the cell like a a knife through hot butter, ching, and there was no need for me to do it, but I'd already figured this is, you know, gonna get that in, and it did add to the match, right? Sure. But I, I didn't need to dive through that cell structure like I thought I would. Uh, but whoever was in charge of gimmicking that table should have realized, look at the size of these guys. It's going right? down. I, I, we don't, we don't, yeah, look, the table broke for me and uh, Sags, it's just standing and on. that was not a gimmick table. Right. I just remember, and I had the same feeling, I believe, when I piled drove Triple H in 97, 97 yep. Man, for the MSG. debut of yeah. Cactus Jack, and we did get that, uh, we got that uh, pile driver in. Compare and contrast that to the pile driver on a not the non-gimmick WWE announced tables, where that thing doesn't give at all unless somebody does something to it. Otherwise, yeah. you're you know you're being pile driven on the house that the third little pig built out of brick. I just can't imagine you know the the disparity between here's this overly gimmicked balsa wood table, <laughs> and then a freaking pull cue. Right. Like, is that the only time you've worked with a pull cue? I can't remember that being used in one of your other matches. I know I there was a know. silly barroom brawl that Brother Love was in on WWE pay-per-view in like the mid-2000s, but I can't remember another time besides maybe skits at the Friendly Tap. Yeah, the Friendly Tap would have had a pool cue, but it probably would have been gimmicked, you know. Yeah. Uh, why? I, I probably just saw something that Sags or Knobs saw laying around and 
and took it with them. I can't recall using a pool cue as a weapon. There's no give to it, you know? No. There's no give it's to crazy. it. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the shovel. Uh, we saw the shovel, and we just recently talked about it not too long ago with Buried Alive in 1996. But th- And then here. But wasn't there one with Vader as well? It feels like... Yeah, he, there was, <clears throat> the story of the shovel is... Uh, I'm going to come out of uh, uh, the stands in yep. Montgomery, Alabama. There was a great angle that took place uh, where uh, uh, Harley Race brought uh, Paul Orndorff into the fold. So it's me, Paul, and uh, me, Paul, Harley, and Leon. Uh, but they want he, Harley wants to find out who the tu- who the tougher is between me and Orndorff in order to face somebody. And then Paul and I have the you know. I watch it, and it's it's not spot after spot, right? And I'm not talking about the pay-per-view match we did, where we had uh, we did, did have some cool stuff lined up, and there were a couple bumps that have you know made the the uh, is a GIF or GIF, or G- whatever, whatever it is, whatever the kids are calling it today. It's one that gets a lot of looks. There's a couple bumps in that match that get a lot of looks, but the give and take between me and Orndorff was just really good. It was a good good basic match. Everything looked good. And that's where Paul came up to me uh, a few days later. I think we had two matches on TV, and he was offered a contract. So here's the guy who headlined WrestleMania, the original WrestleMania, yeah. one of the great heels, uh, I'll say, not just of his era, but of all time, just a great heel. And he tells me he's been offered this contract, and he thinks that the matches that he and I had were a big reason, and he thanks me for it, which is, you know, again, what a compliment. goosebump stuff. Uh, they turn. I get. They turn on me. Orndorff, Leon, uh, Harley, and now I'm going to get my revenge in Montgomery. And I know I have just the one chance to make that impression. Uh, I, you know, Rip Rogers, one of the wisest uh, wrestling sages there is, and he had made me believe you get one good turn. Every, I think he thought in your career. I think you get one turn, good turn everywhere you go, and then everything out after that is uh, case. Big of, show. Yeah, yeah, and you become the big show where Chris Jericho and I can kill three hours on a plane, talking about his turns, not even finish at the end of a three-hour flight, and that was 15 years ago. So yes. the man has turned a lot, but as far as that one great babyface turn, you know, you, you get one, and so I'm going to come out. And we uh, see a steel scoop shovel, whether aluminum alloy, whatever it is, we call everything steel. And I realize I've not worked with a scoop shovel. You know, there was no Danucci class in which you could have brought us aside. <laughs> day one was nasty plunges. <laughs> day two, plunge, right? Yeah. But they, they never mentioned the knee pads, darn it. <laughs> I should have worn the knee pads. So I'm working with the shovel. I'm like trying to like flick my wrist. How What's can I magic? do this? Yeah. yeah, because you don't want to hit the guy with the butt of the shovel. You want it to be as flat as possible. And Harley sees what's going on. And whether he walks over to me or just says it to me from a seated position, it it resounds with me. He says, if you don't hit him out there when we get back here, I'm hitting you. So suffice to say, when it came time to swing that thing, I swung it with everything I had. So Leon's got his back. And it's always, you know you're going to get jumped from behind. You know you know you're going to take a yeah. shovel. I don't know if he knows Harley's put the fear of Harley into me and that right. I'm extra motivated. It's not just the biggest turn of my career. It's the fear of Harley race. So Leon's doing his, I fear no man. I feel no pain, but it comes out as, I fear no man, I feel no power. So I hit him as hard as I could. It steals, you know, you can hear it, right? And now Paul feeds over and Paul gets a hand up, as we all should. And here comes that tough son of a bitch, Harley Race, no hand. He feeds up, he takes that shot. Out comes Kevin Nash, who's not Kevin Nash, but working uh, Vinny Vegas or whatever he is at that time. Boom, down he goes. Out, Mark Canterbury, boom, Mark would be out with a concussion after that. And now I'm waiting for that 11 to 15 guys, extras, who are supposed to come out and feed me, and they don't arrive. When I get to the back, I'm excited about what we've done, but I ask one of the agents, where were the guys? 
said, brother, they took a look what was going on and they took off. <laughs> it took off. So you could argue that these guys are out of the company. You know, they would just come in for a day, day rate of a hundred yeah. bucks, whatever the going rate was. Not enough to be on the receiving end of those shots. So uh, between me and Harley, yeah, Harley inspiring me. I was I was swinging some steel that day, and it was a and it was a great turn. That's and, one of my favorite Harley stories. <laughs> I'd heard it before, but I wanted to make sure we got it in on the show. And before we wrap things up, I want to talk about Max Payne. It feels like you know he had an opportunity to uh, have his day in the sun for both Vince and with WCW, yeah. but it didn't really stick. Why don't you think he had a longer, more illustrious career? Uh, they defrocked him in a way. Uh, he was Max Payne. You know, it was a na- it was a name. He was big, big in Germany, big in Germany, and uh, he became Man Mountain Rock. Yeah, they incorporated the guitar. I don't know for a fact, but I think I think the whole premise, uh, you know, or one of the payoffs of the Double J character is that when we find out that Double J is lip syncing and it's his mistreated roadie, uh, Brian James, who's doing the singing, that because Brian and Max are in a real band, I always thought and didn't have it verified that that's the payoff. That yeah. Boom, now we get this band, and now I'd, I, you'd have to ask Road Dog. He left out of loyalty to Jeff when yeah. Jeff left. Yeah. Not talk about when Jeff left, uh, you know. Um, with China. With but China, the first time. The first time. Uh, and then Jeff left because when I, when I saw, no, Road Dog left because the next time I saw Road Dog was when I was doing my, uh, getting my feet wet with the Mankind character for two days. But, whoa, sorry about that. In the Memphis territory. But I feel like that was supposed to be the payoff is that road dogs a singer here's the band and, and nick patrick was in the band too wow so this was good max was a good songwriter and as we talked about last week steve miller referred to it as the album that pink floyd should have made but never did uh, and max was deep he uh he was he was pretty down on the wrestling business you know I've seen right through your eyes and your filthy effing lies was one of the lines. Wow. And I believe that was written about WCW management. Uh, but for whatever reason, it, it never came to pass. Um, Max, I believe, produces music in Utah. Haven't seen him in a long time. It's cool that he's uh, he's come in for a couple of uh, remote um, uh, these these signings, uh, yeah. virtual signings that popped up during COVID, which you know was really a case of wrestling adapting, yes. and doing a great job. And so I, I remember um, Ashley Massaro's daughter came in and was helping me with my first virtual signing, and she was such a great help. Uh, and that I now I'm signing a few things here and there, Cactus Jack and Max Payne. That's but what cool. a great guy! Great, I loved riding with him, and I and I didn't like Max was a smoker, uh, so when you rode in Miss Christine, you know, and fully uh, whatever it was, do you know, two twenty five, whatever it was, Buick two twenty five, but this thing was decked out with the greatest stereo system I'd ever heard, and to this day have ever heard in a car, and I just like I liked being around Max and Nick. Nick rode with Max too. They were good guys, man. They were both both good guys, and they were my introduction to Tori Amos as well. So that's another story for wow. another day, maybe, and how her music inspired me in the oddest and uh, most most touching of ways. But uh, yeah, it was inside that car on a trip way in you know the southern part of the United States after they'd been bombarding me with everything from you know Metallica was like the light music, you know. Megadeth, Guar, and I finally, Max, do you have anything a little bit lighter? You know, Jack. Sounds kind of like Taker. He had that real deep voice. I, I think I have something to like. And then as soon as I heard the opening chords to uh, the first song on Little Earthquakes, which I should know, uh, man, I was, I was hooked, you know? People sometimes question that taste, but you can't describe what it is that touches somebody's heart. Yeah. You know, and whether it's the voice or the lyrics or whatever, man, yeah, that was a pretty heavy-duty thing for me. Wrestling fans, it's time to win with Zinn. Get to WrestlingPrizes.com to register for your chance to win one of four 
once in a lifetime digital Q&A sessions with wrestling legends Ric Flair, Eric Bischoff, Jim Ross, or Mick Foley. Winners also get an autographed replica championship belt and a prize pack from Zinn, America's number one nicotine pouch. Register once per day, now through July 15th, wrestlingprizes.com. No purchase necessary to enter or win. Open to U.S. residents 21 and over. Void where prohibited. For official rules, visit WrestlingPrices.com. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. If someone relies on you financially, your spouse, your child, anyone, life insurance gives you the peace of mind that they'll have a financial cushion if something ever happens to you. By making it easy to compare your options from top companies, Goliath Life helps make sure you're not paying a penny more than you have to for the life insurance coverage you need to protect those you love. At GoliathLife.com, you can compare personalized quotes from top companies to find your lowest price. The process is fast and easy with no hidden fees, upsells, or hassles. Goliath Life is your one-stop shop to find the life insurance you need at the right price. Head to GoliathLife.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. That's GoliathLife.com. Dot com. Well, uh, you're helping a lot of people through some heavy-duty stuff with Cameo as our favorite part of the show every single week. Cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley. Definitely not a plug. Not a plug. Public service announcement. Uh, uh, let me see what I got here. All right. I, oh, I had a lot of fun with last week. So I don't, la- I don't know if I can top us. last week. I mean, that was a lot. Uh, I don't know if we can top that. I like let me throw see. your cheaters on. I should che- look distinguished. Yeah. Uh, how do you hold up the, uh, the the glasses on the other side? It's, uh, it's there. <laughs> it's just hanging on. Hanging on, yeah. Help me with my wish. My lovely husband of 15 years, a happy 35th birthday. He worked so hard. And then the other one is they're turning 40. Oh, happy. Okay, I'm going to go with the other one here. All right. So please help me wish my lovely husband of 15 years a very happy 35th birthday. I'm going to set up a little music here, if you don't mind. I love and it. And who would we like to hear singing today, the dude or mankind? Or man in the mankind mask, in case WWE's listening. Man in the mankind mask. All right, let's do it. It's definitely not mankind. <laughs> definitely not mankind. In no. In case there are copyright issues here. And let me just make sure I have. This is good TV right here, right? No, this is. Uh, listen, people want to see what goes in to getting a cameo because, as you've said before, Bret Hart is the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. But he probably doesn't enjoy cameo as much as I you. Prob- probably doesn't get as much out of it as I do. Uh, I know he doesn't get as much out of it as we do because <laughs> Dave Silva and I have a blast watching you do these. <laughs> Costume changes and musical accompaniment. Uh, oh, it's going to take five a few seconds to get to my. Mick, I can get you the YouTube premium. Really? I, I can spring. I, I got the five bucks. I'll show you. Oh man, all right, that would be that would be very helpful for me. <laughs> <laughs> so we want mankind, not dude, right? Well, the mankind oh. is, is, is the best. The mankind's the best. Maybe we give him a little dude and mankind here. What do you think? I'm we'll for do it. Dude and mankind. All right, all right. So let me see. Take the glasses off. It's ama- oh, I need the phone in order to do this thing. Again, most guys are just going to look at the screen and, and go right. Yes. So, so I, mine takes. <laughs> <laughs> what a rib! <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> mine takes a little bit of preparation, both physical and mental. All right, so here we go. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, he's more than just the hardcore legend. He's freaking Carrot Top here. He's got props. I don't, I don't know if I want to be freaking Carrot Top. <laughs> Who's the guy who crushes the watermelons? Gallagher. Gallagher. I don't know if I want to be him either. but I'll, I'll. We, It sounded like Gallagher. <laughs> we just watched when you did that nasty plunge. <laughs> That's right, with the watermelon being splattered. Okay, to Brian. All right, let's go. This is ridiculous. Ow, Brian, my main man. Do not just adjust as thine eyes, my brother, my another mother. They are not deceiving you. This is, in fact, Jack. Dude, love, here to send you birthday greetings of peace. Ow, love, and understanding the heartfelt wish that this birthday will be the holliest, the jolliest, the merriest, the mellowest. Ow, most laid-back birthday of them all. Ow, have mercy. 
Wow, whoa, can you believe that, Brian? You just saw uh, the, the hippest cat in the land. Dude love, hey, can we check uh, here? Well, just so you know, Brian, uh, we're on uh, Foley's pod, my ghost, my host with the most, the toast from coast to coast, Conrad Thompson. Can we check and see, uh, because I believe that Dude Love captured tag team gold with Texas' own homegrown Chrome Dome, Stone Cold Steve Austin during the summer of love. Uh, July 1997. So we'll get some verification yeah, that of that. Right. That sounds about right. Okay. But it is Holly, your wife, Holly, Holly Jolly, uh, your wife, who wants me to wish you a very happy 30th, 5th birthday. You guys have been together for 15 years and I know they've been amazing. Look, uh, Brian, the truth is she could have gone the current route. She could have gotten the heart shaped box of chocolates, right? She could have come up with a dozen flowers. She could have perused the internet for something special aware. I think you know what I mean. Instead, she thought outside the box and got you this Foley video. And because you are such a hardworking guy, a wonderful person, a great husband, a fabulous father, and so much more, you deserve all good things. I want to thank you for being a fan of mine as a wrestler and as a person. And now I'd like to introduce to you another face of Foley who is going to give to you his gift of song. So hold on a second. He'll be here momentarily. I sure will. Hello, Brian. This is three-time WWE champion, man in a mankind mask. And I would like to bring to life the spirit of the great Nat King Cole who sang the Christmas song. I bring to you the birthday song. Hot dogs grilling on your barbecue. Yeah. Candles lighting up your cake. Oh my, my. A mankind matches on an old VCR. You know that cell match wasn't fake. Oh, for goodness sake. Some presents and a Hallmark card. Help to make your big day nice. Indeed it does. A chocolate cake with a scoop of ice cream on the side. Make sure to save this guy a slice. You know that man kind's on his way. I'll do my very best to brighten up your day. Oh, your wife Holly and your kids, they're gonna hide and try to see if I'm every bit as handsome in real life as I am on your TV. And so I offer you this simple song, uh, for it's the mankindly thing to do, I think it is. Although it's been said many times, many ways, Brian. Happy birthday to you. And may all your days be nice. Wow. Uh, did you guys know that Mankind packed that kind of a vocal punch? I did not. Oh, my goodness. It's like Nat King Cole was alive in front of us. Thank you, Brian, for being such a big fan. And thank you, Holly, for thinking of me to make this day Nice. Yeah. Let's just Nat. keep the music going. Just play us out, <laughs> Nat King Cole. Just, just this time, uh, Book uh, a cameo right now. Cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley. Do it on your computer, not on the app. Yeah, because uh, the app takes a large percentage of the money. And I think even though I try to do the best job, when you see them taking that 33%, yeah, it, just, it stings a little bit. So use, use the computer. Uh, cameo.com slash Mick Foley. I love doing these things. And now the onus is going to be on me to write some new songs, right? I'm going to try oh, wow. to have a new song, new birthday song. Uh, as we approach Mother's Day, I've only got one, which is one more than I've ever heard before. But I probably, probably need some company. Uh, sometimes I'll ask my kids to come in as the Foley family singers. How about that? Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, told my youngest son, Huey, to hit the bricks because a he's out of tune 
He's off time, and he looks like he's in a hostage video. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas my son Mickey's really good. Noel loves doing it, and uh, and Dewey. He's only got one or two under his belt, but he really put his all into it. And don't forget, we've still got to see the Marv impersonation. The oh, mimicking that's right. of Marv. I will bring Marv. I will bring Mickey in in the next few weeks, and we will see Mickey uh, mimicking Marv being electrocuted, and also Marv trying to warn Harry that there's a brick coming his way from the third story building. Can't wait. All that and more coming up soon right here on Foley is Pod. Have a nice day and thanks again for choosing to make us uh, part of your day. <laughs> <laughs>